Welcome everybody. Um, there's been a number of changes to the board membership since the last meeting. Um, so it'd be great if everybody could introduce themselves because we've got some new members. I am just going to go around my screen if that's OK, and then it, rather than do a roll call, it'd be nice for you to say who you are, your organisation. If you're representing a sector as well, that will be lovely. Um, so I'll start with Lucy. Hello, good morning. My name's Lucy Robertshaw. I'm Assistant Director at DARTS and I'm here to represent the Health and Social Care Forum. Welcome, Lucy. Uh, Joanne? Hi, <clears throat> Joe McDonough here. I'm Director of Strategy at Ardash and I'm here for Catherine Singh this morning. Lovely. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, morning everybody, Andy Collins from Public Health and I'm on the agenda to give a presentation on the impact of children from parental alcohol issues today. Okay, um, Cynthia? Uh, Cynthia Ransom, Councillor for the Sprock Award. Welcome Cynthia. Um, okay, this is where it gets different. Is, Ria is that Rihanna? I think so. Hello everybody, Rihanna Nelson, Director of Learning Skills culture and opportunities in sector DCS. Lovely, welcome Rihanna. I'm just going to have to do initials now because I can't test myself that well. So LB? Hiya, yeah, I'm uh, Laura Britton. I'm from the University of Leeds um, and I'm going to present in the Stanford <laughs> programme later in the meeting today. Lovely, welcome Laura. Thank you. Uh, Nula? Yeah, I, Councillor Nuala Fennelly, Cabinet Member for Children, Young People and Schools and Lead Member for Children's Services. Welcome, Nuala. Um, James? Good morning, everybody. Uh, James Thomas, uh, Chief Executive of Doncaster Children's Services Trust. Welcome. Um, right, who can I see and who can't I see? Nigel? No, Nigel, it's not there. No, Nigel's not here, Chair. OK, G somebody called G. Is there initial G? That's all. G. Oh, that's Glyn, isn't it? That's Glyn. Is that Glyn? Yeah, oh, Glyn. that's Glyn. Have you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Hello, my name is Glyn Butcher. I'm from the People Focus Group in Intake. Uh, community sector. OK, welcome, Glenn. Uh, Louise? Hi, everybody. Louise Robson. I'm from Public Health at the Council and I've been supporting the board since 2011-12. Oh, <laughs> so I've been here a long time <laughs> and I'm still here, Rachel. Lovely. Um, and then we've got David. So I'm Dr David Crichton, local GP and chair of Doncaster Clinical Commissioning Group. Thanks. Thank you, David. Katie? Hi, I'm Katie Darrison, Place Digital Director and responsible for the digital strategy. I'm here to talk about digital inclusion today. Lovely. Uh, Mel, who I think is a new member. Welcome, Mel. Yeah, my name is Melanie Palin. I'm a new district commander at Doncaster, a place in uh, Shawmore. Good to see you, Mel. Um, we've got Duncan. Hello, uh, Duncan Chambers, researcher from the University of Sheffield, here to observe the meeting today. Thank you. Lovely. Annette? Yeah, hello, Annette Haywood. I'm also a researcher at University of Sheffield and I'm observing the meeting today. OK, welcome. And Thank then we've got Andrew. Hi, I'm Andrew Goodall, Chief Operating Officer at Healthwatch Doncaster, and I'm um, deputising for Steve Shaw, who's the chair of Healthwatch Doncaster, who gives his apologies today. OK, um, so other people will just have joined. So um, who else have we got, Amber, that hasn't introduced? We've got Alan. Um, Alan Wilch is here. Alan, OK. Alan. Morning, morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alan Wilch. I'm head of policy and intelligence at the council and presenting the borough strategy item today. Welcome. We've got Dan Swain, director of economy and. Good morning, everyone. Dan Swain, director of economy and environment, Doncaster Council. <laughs> Dan, it's also your first meeting, so welcome. Hello. Hello. Re uh, replacing Peter Dale, who has been attending the meeting. Thanks, Amber. Uh, we've got Dave Richmond. 
Morning, I'm Dave Richmond. I'm Chief Executive at Scent Lake <coughs> and I've been here five, six weeks now. Welcome, Dave. Your first meeting as well, I think, isn't it, of the board replacing Paul? So good to see you. Thank you. We've got Vanessa Powell Hoyland. Vanessa? Hi, good morning, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Vanessa Powell Hoyland, Public Health Lead, and I've got an agenda item on the uh, meeting today. Brilliant. Thank you, Vanessa. I think that's it. Oh, yeah. oh Rupert's here. Rupert's oh, of around. course. <laughs> Hi, hi, Rachel. Morning, everyone. Rupert Suckling, Director of Public Health here in Doncaster. Okay. And I'm here too, Rachel Phil Holmes, Director of Adults oh, Health yeah, and Wellbeing. Too. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Phil. It's I haven't quite worked out at the plus seven now. You work it out. Technology was never my strong point. Um, okay. So thank you ever so much. We've cut. There's nobody yeah. that missed out, is there? Oh, Nigel's here as well, Chair. Nigel's just arrived. Morning, everybody. Morning. Nigel, just want to say you are. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. I'm a um, cabinet member for public health, leisure and culture. Sorry, well, I'm late. That's all right, Nigel. And Kath has just joined us. Yeah, I had a bit of a trouble, trouble getting in this morning, but I'm here now. Kath, we're just finishing introductions. You just want to say who you are? Yeah, sure. My name is Kath Witherington. I'm the Chief Executive of Voluntary Action Doncaster. And it's your first meeting, Kath, and it's lovely to see you as well. We've got a Thank number you. of people that it's their first meeting. Um, so whilst, yes, it is an official health and wellbeing board, we, I do try and run these quite informally so everybody gets the best out of the meeting. Um, so I will just go on to the official things that I have to talk about. Apologies. We've received apologies from Jackie Pedersen, Richard Parker and Catherine Singh. But obviously we've got Joe here for Catherine, but I believe no replacement for Richard due to operational priorities at the hospital. OK, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you don't spend your life on teams like many people do. Um, so welcome to Duncan and Annette who have introduced themselves. They're from Sheffield University um, and they're undertaking they're looking at uh, research in the council um, and how we can build better organisational capacity to do research. So this is one of a number of meetings that they are attending. Um, just some housekeeping. Um, this is really about ensuring we don't have any background noise so everybody can be heard. Um, if somebody wishes to speak, if you could raise the hand, your hand function on Teams and between Amber and myself, we will uh, ask you to speak and um, if mobile phones can go on to silent and I always do mine at this point point. Um, also if we don't use the chat facility um, just uh, for this meeting and if you aren't speaking microphones can be muted. Amber has already announced that we do record this meeting um, and will be available to view on the council's YouTube channel. Um, by joining the meeting all those present include any members of the public are accepting that their images, voices will be retained and broadcast by the council. OK, so that's the formalities out of the way. So on to the item, uh, the agenda now. So on to chair's announcements. I don't have any formal announcements to make, just to say welcome to the new members. Um, it's great to have you here. Uh, the board has, uh, I think, changed over the last few years. Um, our remit is obviously to improve the, the well-being and health of the population and we really take a very broad approach to that, um, unlike perhaps some areas that quite have a, a fixed uh, commissioner type of membership. So we welcome everybody's input and challenge. Um, we've all got a part to play in improving health and well-being um, and hopefully that will be demonstrated today as we go through the agenda. And obviously last time we spent a lot of time uh, for people that were here talking about how we were coming out of lockdown and obviously we're now back in it um, and just my thanks to everybody that is doing such an uh, amazing role in uh, dealing with the lockdown uh, whether that's the hospital whether that's a voluntary community group or whether that's services in the community um, thank you very much and we all appreciate everything you are doing 
So on to item three, which is exclusion of the press and public. There are no items on today's agenda where the press and public are to be excluded. So on to item four, which is a standing item uh, for people that are new. We always allow time on this agenda for public questions. We don't have um, set questions, unlike a formal cabinet meeting. People can attend and ask any questions they want. And people do know that if members of the public have bothered to attend, I don't stick to the 15 minutes because that is really important that they have an opportunity to have their say. I have kindly, though, been made aware of somebody who's attending today that would like to speak, um, and that's Glyn. So over to you, Glyn. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to raise everybody's awareness around Christmas uh, and uh, suicide prevention, uh, suicide risk. With, with the lockdown that we've got and uh, the amount of loneliness, isolation, uh, long co term conditions, the effect it's having on people's mental health, loss of job, even of losing family members through COVID, debt, domestic violence, and uh, we're worried about suicide rate in Doncaster. So we're asking if we could have a joint strategy message sent out from uh, Council R uh, CCG, all the partners. Uh, a consistent message about what help is out there at Christmas, what services are are open at Christmas. I know uh, since lockdown, we've had 150 calls a month. We're now getting over a, up to a thousand calls a month where people are needing mental health support and practical support, food, uh, debt advice. Uh, so we know it's going to get worse at Christmas if we're getting a thousand calls now. So we're looking at our partners and asking is your Suicide prevention strategy up to date. What is your suicide prevention strategy? What are your opening times? We can send a constant message out to all our partners and people who are phoning up needing support at Christmas. On, on people's radars, that we think Christmas is going to be a particular time this year. Uh, okay. Glenn, you're breaking up. Have you finished the question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Okay. Yeah, I've got the question, Glenn. Yeah, before I, before I go to Phil or perhaps Rupert to answer that and other colleagues, just to say thank you for everything you're doing at the People Focus Group, to have that many calls and dealing with them and supporting people. You, you're very, um, you know, the, the Facebook pages you have, the, the support that you're providing is absolutely vital. So thank you ever so much from the board's point of view for providing that, Glenn, and it is really appreciated. So I've got two colleagues with hands up. So Phil first and then Joe, please. Yeah, thank you for the um, for the prompt, Glyn. It's, it's a massively important issue. Um, I suppose what I'd say is that we've got a, um, a mental health and emotional well-being group that we set up kind of in between the, the COVID waves. That, that's an all age group because it's really important. For obviously for us to understand that mental health issues apply to people of all ages, not not, not just adults. Um, so we've got some really useful um, joint working with children's colleagues there. Um, and the focus there is, is to think about the, the sorts of things that you described. So from my perspective, I absolutely agree and accept the action to make sure that between the council and Ardash and the other organisations represented here, we, we are very clear about the, the emotional well-being and mental health support available to communities. And as you say, Glyn, we particularly focus on Christmas as a time of additional pressure in the best of times for, for, for some people. And we make sure that we're, we're clear at that point. So I think it's a really timely prompt from yourself, Glyn, and, and we'll make sure that we respond to it. OK, thank you, Phil. Joe. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Yes, to, to echo what Phil has said, uh, we've been doing some work uh, looking at the referral patterns into our service and demand and how that's changed since um, March. So we saw some real uh, dips in referrals during the first lockdown 
and we uh, sort of emerged from that despite trying to provide uh, the best support we can with some patients who are really deteriorating mental health and seeing patients coming forward who were brand new to the service and uh, actually quite poorly. So we've been looking at how we can support those people and get back up and running as best we can. None of our mental health services closed during the lockdown first time, uh, but the general public um, obviously weren't presenting themselves or engaging as much as we would like. We are now all of our services are still on the whole running virtually except for those where we think the risk that's presenting um, is significant and our staff are using appropriate PPE to then go in and, and work with patients in their own homes because it often it's um, a real indicator of how their mental health is to actually see people in their own homes. Um, I would say our referrals are back up to normal levels at the moment uh, for IAPT and um, we have seen sharp rise in referrals for adult mental health and as Glyn said we know that space are experiencing high demand and we're working really closely with them in terms of the links with crisis team which is great. We are seeing people who weren't classed as vulnerable families going into the first lockdown coming out of this, the lockdown really what we would class as vulnerable in for many reasons whether that be domestic violence, uh, food poverty, um, mental health and, and as uh, debt as, as Glyn has said. Um, we know that there has been a predicted surge in mental health demand post um, the first lockdown of, of a 20% surge in referrals. We haven't quite seen that yet, but we are seeing pockets of increase in terms of new referrals. Uh, but we are also seeing, as I say, deterioration of patients um, during this process. We've done some work as we've headed into the second lockdown trying to identify patients who we can't engage with digitally and that's it would uh, be good to see the presentation later this morning uh, and we're trying to set up some safe clinics and um, so if we can't actually see people face to face and people haven't got any sort of digital tech that they can come into a safe space in terms of um, social restrictions and um, being able to use digital devices that we can then clean down in between. We have with the CCG um, been successful in accessing some mental health winter pressures funding of about £90,000. So we're, ex we're investing some of that with safe space to expand the offer over the Christmas and winter period. Uh, we're bringing in two extra support workers who in the adult and older people's team who can more proactively contact people during the period where we think there is a risk of further deterioration. Uh, and we have got an additional CAMS worker as well. Uh, and we've got hopefully we think we've got a bit of money to support. Parents. So we have been doing some ongoing comms about mental health coping strategies. It's stress awareness week this week. I think I get mixed up. We have that many different <laughs> ones that we're campaigning on um, and we are actively promoting IAPT. I think um, so I'm more than happy to coordinate something, Glyn, that says what's open and available over Christmas. That's great. No problem. And it's that balance, as Phil has said, between mental health and emotional well-being versus deterioration of people with a severe mental illness and balancing the two. And we could all need our part to play in that. We don't particularly want to banner any of it under preventing suicide explicitly because we don't want to um, be placing that into the minds of people. We don't want everyone thinking, you know, there's a huge, there's a lot of rhetoric in the press, you know, that we might get a pandemic of suicides or a tsunami of suicides. And we don't want to be using that sort of language, of course. 
uh, but absolutely more than happy to look at how we can link up and, and do some sort of coordinated, not just comms, but a shared um, almost like service directory for the two or three weeks straddling Christmas so we know exactly who's on offer when, who's on call, who isn't, so we've got a coordinated approach. Thank okay, you. thank you, Joe. I've got lots of hands up. So I've got David, James, Rupert, and then Rihanna. David? So, uh, Rachel, thank you. Uh, Glyn, um, it's been a common theme in my messages that have gone out through COVID. So you'd expect me to sign up to uh, a sort of joint communication strategy about this. Um, next week is uh, World uh, Men's Day. Um, I've done yeah. a blog I've signed off yesterday, which includes um, the Zero uh, Suicide Alliance. I did that training last year and we're encouraging all uh, staff to to repeat that training to, to raise awareness. Um, Joe, Joe I, I hear what you're saying about not raising the profile. Um, the training does actually, uh, you know, contradict the fact that talking about suicide doesn't make more people um, commit suicide. So I think I'd just make that point that, that, you know, we need to talk about it because it's the people who aren't able to talk who are most at risk of this. Um, <laughs> I would signpost people, um, even with early signs of, uh, of um, you know, uh, stresses with mental well-being. Of every mind matters. It's uh, accessible to all, and that's an NHS resource. And finally, um, I just think um, we just need to be mindful of um, supporting our staff as well. Uh, yeah. You know, while the public are, um, you know, really under huge pressure with COVID, I think um, we we can't underestimate the pressures that are having on our workforce as well. And within the uh, NHS People's Plan that was published in the summer, um, there are lots of resources that are available to um, try and support health and care staff to. Um, you know continue the battle because it's um we're here for a while now um so yeah from ccg absolutely we'll uh we'll commit to um be involved in anything going forward thanks thank you thanks very much oh, I'm doing that thanks very much david and i can see phil's said that they're happy to pick this up in the mental health and emotional well-being cell um so then i've got james Thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, just to make the point uh, that when we talk about all age, there is clearly also a particular challenge around children and young people presenting with um, suicide intentions, suicide attempts uh, um, self-harm as well. We have seen uh, an increase in presentation through um, information from a variety of sources. So within the children's cell uh, of our recovery phase, but also within the mental health cell, there is a specific focus and attention to the particular challenges uh, that lockdown and ongoing restrictions have had on children and young people, their ability to network um, and to, to maintain their contacts. Clearly with schools reopening, there's a, a new opportunity for professionals to work with uh, children and young people, uh, and that provides an additional safety factor for them. Uh, but um, the, the children's cell and the um, children's mental health strategy is looking at equipping professionals with better identification and signposting through to uh, those services as well. Um, I think Rihanna, I saw Rihanna's hang up. It may well be, but I've just made the point that Rihanna was going to. So I don't know whether Rihanna, you wanted to, to add anything at that point. If, if you don't mind, Rachel, so yeah, that's just, fine. Uh, just to add what James is saying is we, for example, have trained um, over a thousand practitioners within schools um, in terms of trauma informed practice and identification. So we are focusing on prevention through some funding that we've received from the DfE in terms of emotional well-being in schools and return to schools, but also bolstering our own mental health provisions for young people in terms of early identification, some preventative work, preventative strategies through social media campaigns, etc. right up to a number of presentations that we've seen at the DRI recently for our young people and making sure that those young people are supported um, throughout that process. So just to give some assurances around the children's side. OK, thank you. And then Rupert. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rachel. I mean, I think it uh, sort of almost gets to the heart of what the board is. Uh, about really and I suppose the way I think about uh, suicide in particular is potentially it's a sort of it's the canary in the mine in terms of it's often the end result of a whole set of influences and it's great to hear about the work around uh, mental health services. Uh, we've got to remember that we did take an approach to broader well-being which was about connecting people together in the community yeah. and addressing sort of community well-being and that's obviously been uh, a real challenge with uh, Covid restrictions in terms of how groups and people can 
gather so we need to be mindful of that and then uh, as it's dan and dave's first meeting we can't forget the important role that housing and having a job has in terms of mental yeah. health more generally uh, and then uh, beyond that there are particular groups that are at more at risk of uh, suicide mental health in particular we've seen quite a lot of uh, challenges across all age groups uh, through um, sort of lgbtq communities so again links into that you know overarching approach in terms of how we talked about being more compassionate uh, as a place but i think it's quite a good topic for us to think and consider because i think we've all got something that we can offer into the space and the challenge is how we coordinate as effectively uh, as possible it was a great question glenn to get us back thinking about what what is it we're really about uh, and how can we all contribute to this so thanks for that glenn thank you and i can see in the chat that Phil said that is given a way forward there about how that will be coordinated and include an all age focus with the involvement of Lee, which is which is good. Um, I've just got one more hand up, Andy. Yeah, that's that's me, Chair. Just to pick up on um, what Joanne um, uh, mentioned earlier on. So next week is Alcohol Awareness Week, and uh, and the national focus for that is is alcohol and mental health. Uh, so what we've done is um, we've linked in with uh, Rdash Communications, IAPT, and in Doncaster we're particularly going to focus and highlight uh, women in that. So our alcohol, mental health, and women, because we know certainly during lockdown and the COVID period that that, that certainly women and caregivers, um, you know, during this challenging period are uh, struggling with um, you know drink and also um, relatively low level and, and mental health. So um, it will be going out through the IAPT. There's little videos and snippets and lots of social media going out next week, either through the IAPT social media challenge ch channels or the rethink your drink website okay thanks very much and i think we've got another i know we shouldn't be using chat but i think people just get used to it um obviously cast's offering there to raise that awareness through the vcf vcf newsletter which is great so i think um i, I did just want to pick up on what rupert said in terms of community well-being because i know certainly as councillors we see we have seen that for a lot of people, their support networks, their outlets, they're going for a coffee has completely gone. Um, and, and the impact that's having long term and just very personally, I looked at my mum's calendar the other day and it's gone from like six or seven activities a week, really, you know, with different groups that she goes to, to a flu jab and a doctor's appointment. And it just really struck me. And, and, and you know, she's not alone. And it's about how do we... And I've got one older lady in my community that now goes out at school, at children, at school leaving times, just so she can see somebody and have a conversation. And and and, and that these people, will, it'd be good to understand about digital inclusion, about how we get those people, because because I just think we're seeing it. And I can see Nigel coming in, so he's probably got something to add to that. Nigel? Yeah, cheers for that, Rachel. Um, yeah, I think, I think, the the big issue we've got is that that that, that uh, an awful lot of people are are now tuned in and they have got digi digital access and um, they do, but there is a large percentage of people, particularly our more mature uh, residents, that haven't. Um, and it's it, even even the concept of getting those people online while you're going through restrictions and a lockdown period is is going to be difficult because obviously. There needs to be that that physical element of training so they can understand it. So I think at this moment in time, it's a bit of a, a no go. One of the things that Heritage Doncaster's done, um, and and I think it's worked out well, is that they they've had a, on a couple of occasions set up phone lines um, for various topics where residents can actually ring in and have a conversation with somebody. So most mature people, we know that they've got access to a phone. So the, the launched one last week, and it was around um, the Roman history of, of, of Doncaster, Danem. Um, people can just ring in and have a conversation and get to know about it, you know, and, and the history and, and have that, that, you know, that bit of a discussion. So I think th there is a digital exclusion issue, which is really big. But I think, you know, apart from that, I think we, we need to... Um, measure our response particularly for some of our mature more mature residents in terms yeah. of getting back to actually picking up phones 
and putting on services where there is that phoning service that they can access because not everybody's going to be able to get on teams or zoom or whatever they call it um, um so we can talk about it but i think that the services maybe need to look at that even more thank you yeah Thanks very much, Nidge, and perhaps that's something, Phil, that can be picked up in that cell. I've just got Cynthia, and then that's going to be the last question, and we're going to move on or comment, Cynthia. Cynthia? I can see your hand up. Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. Hello, Chair. Uh, yes, I would agree with what Nigel said. Absolutely, absolutely right about the telephoning. Um, my ward is very spread, very rural. Um, and you're absolutely right. People aren't going to learn um, IT equipment in the lockdown. But the phoning is absolutely excellent. And I have a long list of people that I phone that I know lives alone and this type of thing. And I think as councillors, it's something that we could do um, but you're absolutely right, right with the phone in. It's very important. Yeah, thanks, Cynthia. So perhaps some of those, Phil, just getting back to what you put in the chat, then you'll pick that up about Glyn's specific question about support. But I'm assuming as well that links in with the communities teams, these other concerns about community wellbeing can be picked up. I think so, Chair. I think so. I think the um it's a bit like I don't understand too much like I'm being a bit slippery it's a bit like the point that Joe made about trying to balance some of the sharper end of mental health with the right. with the broader grip on emotional well-being I think what, what Glyn's asking at the very least that we make people very clear uh, clearly aware about what is out there and all the things that all of our organizations are doing um, and then it's looking at what we can accelerate or, or kind of pick up on more um, with other pressures around as well. So I don't want to give an open-ended commitment because then that would be dishonest of me to say, yes, we're going to be ringing around everyone from the communities team or whatever. But I, but it's, it's points well made around, around more outreach that would help isolated people at this point in time. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Phil. And I think there are other partners on the, the call uh, from Voluntary Action, et cetera, and I can see information about Social Isolation Alliance. So the information's there. I think it's just about joining it up. Yeah. Uh, which will be good. We don't expect you to reinvent the wheel or anything. It's just all there. Right. Thank you ever so much for Glyn. You've got, you've basically, as Rupert said, got to the heart of what this board's about in one easy question. So, so you can chair the next meeting, Glyn. <laughs> right, we'll move on. Okie doke. So that's public questions. Five, declaration of interest, the usual rules. If anybody's got any, please declare it. Item six is the minutes of the health and wellbeing meeting, which were held on the 3rd of September. Um, we've not heard that anybody has any objection to those, so we can take them as a correct record. I can't see anybody disagreeing. That's good. And then on to item seven, which is over to Rupert, who's going to provide an update with regard to the direct health impacts of COVID-19 in Doncaster and the steps being taken to address them. And I believe throughout the presentation, all the speakers are happy to share their screen and you've got permission to do it, so. Thanks, uh, no no presentation for me uh, this morning, Thanks. Roz. Uh, um, uh, Roz, Ethan. Rachel. <laughs> I'm so used to uh, briefing the mayor about uh, uh, COVID. It's uh, it's unusual to have to brief uh, uh, somebody else. So uh, you look similar. Uh, I do understand. It's fine. Um, so uh, when we last met on the third of September, uh, we were uh, coming to the end of uh, what we didn't realise then, but was a plateau in terms of the the COVID um, pandemic. So uh, one of the key measures and metrics that we use to measure uh, what's happening with coronavirus is something called the seven day rate per 100,000 people. And at that stage in September, the 3rd of September, the rate was uh, 3.2 people per 100,000 over a seven day period. And that equated to about 10 people uh, a week um, um, having a coronavirus. Uh, what's happened uh, since then across Doncaster and across the rest of the country is we saw a doubling in those number of cases through September, through uh, October. Uh, uh, and I can say it has started to plateau 
uh, at the beginning of uh, November for us. So uh, the the rate rose to um, a high point of over 550 per 100,000 people. So we went from 10 people a week to sort of 1,500 uh, people a week uh, being uh, diagnosed with uh, coronavirus. Uh, there were a couple of reasons why Doncaster's rate appeared to go up much uh, faster than other areas. Um, so that actually Doncaster's rate became the sixth highest in the country. Uh, one of the reasons was uh, due to outbreaks in uh, care homes. So we've uh, had a number of outbreaks in uh, care homes. Uh, again, unfortunately, uh, this time, though, not um, due to people being discharged from the hospital with coronavirus, but is likely to have been unfortunately brought in by um, staff who um, were infected in their um, communities. Uh, the second reason, and it is a particular uh, issue for Doncaster, is we have four prisons and any outbreaks of uh, coronavirus in the prisons um, uh, get reflected in terms of our numbers. Uh, you'll also have picked up that um, whilst the numbers were going up, the, there was a change in terms of the government uh, approach to coronavirus and we saw the instigation of a number of tiers and Doncaster went into medium level of restrictions on the 14th of September, went into high on the 20th of October very high on the 24th of October and on the 5th of November we went into national uh, restrictions and it's definitely uh, partly due to those um, uh, restrictions certainly the the high and more recently the very high that has helped our rates start to fall so our rate today is 479 cases per 100,000 people uh, and that's the period the 30th of October to the 5th of November. Uh, what um, we have seen though with all those cases is uh, cases in over 60s, people over the age of 60 and that's got a direct impact on the uh, hospital. So uh, one of the reasons why uh, colleagues from the Acute Trust aren't on the call is because they are managing the impact of that on their, their wards. So uh, earlier in the week, there were over 200 people in uh, DRI with coronavirus, 17 people in ITU, and that is a higher number than um, we saw in the first wave. Uh, so uh, whereas in the first sort of wave, the hospitals uh, stopped doing all elective surgery, outpatients, um, but kept open for emergencies, uh, as well as COVID and emergencies, they are also still trying to do some of the emergency surgery. So particularly around uh, people with cancer, for instance, that still need um, uh, procedures. So uh, what we've uh, what we've seen over the last two months is increasing number of cases and an increasing impact on the health and care system. Uh, we've also seen uh, widespread impacts on all uh, services. So I think all sort of statutory organisations on the call will have seen impacts on their workforce. Uh, and uh, the challenge with this virus is that uh, what happens is you get whole teams that either get infected or health have to self-isolate. So it's not spread out across your entire workforce. Uh, and in teams which or in organisations which have some very specialist teams that, that can cause a, a major challenge to uh, respond to. Um, in terms of, uh, I suppose, other things that have happened in terms of coronavirus and um, support. So there's been additional support to local government to support businesses. So businesses that have had to close or have had to uh, lose um, uh, money as a result of some of the restrictions. and. Uh, Although that won't completely make up for their loss of earnings, I think we, think we welcome that as better than uh, nothing. We've also seen an extension of the furlough scheme. Uh, however, that may have come slightly too late to prevent uh, job losses at the end of October. Uh, we've also seen announcements around mass uh, testing and uh, Doncaster has been announced as one of 67 areas that will have access to uh, um, what are uh, they're called lateral flow tests. So these are tests that people 
feeding within sort of 20, 25 minutes, which uh, avoids the need for a laboratory. Uh, and we'll be talking later in the week with government about that. Uh, and also we've heard uh, announcements around the um, I suppose positive news about the potential for mass vaccination and again NHS colleagues uh, have been asked to start plan um, for what that uh, looks like. So uh, it's definitely a better situation than we were in two weeks ago in terms of the numbers of uh, coronavirus cases however the pressure in the health system is still there and will still be there until we get that rate down, I would say at least to under 200 per 100,000 uh, and probably needs to go much lower to give us the um, capacity that we need to, to manage for uh, winter. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's going to be a very difficult uh, time for us all, uh, Rachel. Uh, and I suppose the final thing um, to say is just thank you to everyone for the work that their organisations have, have done to be part of the, the local approach. Uh, I do feel that we have got a good approach to, to, to COVID locally, Rachel. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, David? So if I could just add two uh, brief things, Rachel, I think the first thing is to acknowledge that the NHS has um, escalated into its NHS level four incident again. Um, that's what it went into in the first wave. So that's just reflects the pressures that Rupert has said of, of the acute care and, and sick patients um, be, being in hospital. The second thing, though, is, is just to make a, a note to people out there who may be listening that um, services are open uh, as normal. Um, so please don't hold off seeking attention if you have a medical problem. Um, you know, I know it's um, easy to think, right, we're in lockdown, I'll not, I'll not bother people. But if, if you do have worries, whether they be mental health or physical health problems, then please do access your services as normal. Um, the initial conversation will be on the telephone, but um, we don't want people hold to putting things off um, be, be because of the situation we're in. So that's just a plea there, please. Thanks very much, David. Any other questions? No, nope, can't see any other hands up. OK, then. So thank you for that, Rupert. Um, and we were just asked to note the presentation. Um, so then on to item eight, which is the update on the borough strategy, Alan. Um, we have been talking about this before, um, and the purpose of this presentation is to provide an update um, on the development of our borough strategy and our long term plan for the borough. And if whilst uh, people, Alan and others, as we move on the agenda are presenting, if people can be thinking about what they need to do from their organisation's point of view um, to contribute to the the, uh, the asks that we're going to get. Over to you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, always a bit of a hard one to follow the, uh, the previous item, which was about the here and now, to something which feels a bit more long term. Um, but that's kind of what this item is really trying to do. And there's two real lines of inquiry on this one. One is around what does a health and wellbeing board support look like to emerging strategy? And what are changes to some of the emerging strategy itself? So there's two lines of inquiry that I'm really interested in exploring today. Um, and there'll be a couple of pause points and questions, but I'll carry on until the end if that's OK, Chair, and then we'll take any comments that people have. So we did have a brief discussion last time on this, and just as a reminder, this is an emerging borough strategy, so this is not anywhere near approval or agreement yet. We're looking at that in summer next year. So this is really some emergent thinking, really. Uh, and what we're trying to what I'm trying to describe here in this slide is what our emerging thinking where we've got to on it. So at the moment, what we're thinking is that there is a central mission for this borough strategy and that we're talking about what the next 10 years looks like for the borough. Um, and surrounding that central mission is six well-being goals. So we're putting well-being at the heart of this borough strategy. Uh, and that's something that perhaps hasn't been as prominent in previous big strategic um, directional documents we, we've kind of put together in the past. So the six wellbeing goals, you can see those in, in this kind of uh, circle, if you like. So fair and inclusive at the heart of it, greener and cleaner around the outside. And then there are four quadrants which are skilled and creative, prosperous and connected, safe and resilient and healthy and compassionate. And, and hopefully you can see some evolution from what we've got already. So the current 
borough strategy that we have is our learning, working, living and caring. And hopefully you can see some evolution from some of those things. So we're trying to build on what we've got, build on some of the strengths that we have, but taking them to what we think is really needed over the next 10 years. So for example, our working theme, we're now talking around a prosperous and connected theme because we think actually that's the that's the real heart of what, we, what we're talking about. So we're trying to evolve and get better <coughs> at what we've already got. There's also as part of this, we think there's something we need to have a greater focus on. So there's some points there you can see that perhaps weren't as prominent and are not as prominent in the current borough strategy. So very little mention of compassion, very little mention of Doncaster as a place of places, which reflects some of our kind of discussions around locality. Maybe not as much emphasis on safety or resilience either, and perhaps not as much in there around creativity. And we feel all of those things are things that probably do deserve extra prominence. And we're trying to play that into our emergent thinking. On top of that, there's lots of engagement that, that, that has happened over the past 18 months and continue to happen. And it's important that we build that in. So some of the work around Doncaster Talks in a number of its guises has kind of really flagged up that, that community safety was a real kind of real issue for people as well as, the, as well as environmental issues. And again, both those things probably have extra prominence in our emerging thinking this time and not as much last time. So really, this is a reminder of, of the discussion we had last time. This is our framework for what we think the borough strategy could include. A mission at the centre and six wellbeing goals that would really direct our thinking going forward over the next 10 years. So if we've reminded ourselves about what the what we what our emergent thinking is for the borough strategy, there's a, there's a bit of a question that remi remains around how they all interact with each other which is a question that we're wrestling with and, and, and none more so than that kind of healthy and compassionate theme where we've put uh, in, in, the, in the existing kind of theme, which is caring in our existing framework we've got. We put a lot of things in there, but actually there was some work done from the strategy unit in West Midlands, which talked a lot about how there are other influences in place. And this is nothing new for, for people on this call, I'm sure. But you can see here in terms of some of the things that they've reflected on. This was this was a couple of weeks ago now around what are some of those determinants around physical health? And you can see around income, lack of work, housing uh, for mental health, uh, similar income work experience of the crime justice system, poor no housing. So actually what we're seeing is is those determinants of, um, uh, of of the wider kind of health and care system really. And what they put together was some which what they called a causal map, which is what I'm highlighting here, if you can see the movement of my mouse. What they've tried to describe is is COVID or uh, and the uh, the last six nine months has really had an impact and uh, some of this is what you've already been discussing so had a really big impact on our kind of socio-economic status of, uh, of of a number of individuals and perhaps really shone a light on some of the inequalities we have in society but it's trying to demonstrate how that then impacts on other things in this wider system so the fact that if we're in, if we're if it has an impact here, it then has an impact on our population health status and also then on healthcare delivery as well. And what this causal map tries to do is tries to set out about how each of those different areas interrelate. And it's really, in, and I found it quite interesting as a causal map to reflect back into our kind of uh, framework for the borough strategy. So actually, we've got things happening here. Uh, which some of which are happening right now and some of the things we're describing. So uh, what Rupert just described around healthcare delivery, about what's happening in the hospital, actually that's happening right right now. And equally, we've got our kind of longer term things around our socioeconomic status and the fact that um, uh, low income, lack of work, poor or quality housing. Actually, if we're if we know some of those things are happening and we've seen some of the changes with our economy and perhaps changes into next year, what are the likely things we're going to be facing as we agree the boat as we agree the strategy next summer actually what's the conditions that we're going to be under and so it was what we thought was it was a really interesting kind of how this causal map and this well-being will can actually work work together and understand how where we may have been thinking about healthy and compassionate we need to ensure that these various quadrants can work together and i suppose the question from that is really about how um, how the Health and Wellbeing Board fits across this particular map. And it might be that actually, it's actually the real focus of the Health and Wellbeing Board is all of it. We've got, we've got a play into all of this. 
Or is it that actually we need to take more of a focus on population health or more of a focus on socioeconomic status? And I just thought it was interesting as we get in to start to think about what the long term looks like for the what for the borough strategy. It's starting to think about well, actually, what are our, um, our organising features? What are they going to be concentrating on or what's their reason to uh, to deal with some of the things that we're going to face over the next uh, certainly the next 18 months, but longer term as well? So the first pause point is really about where does that health, where do we think the health wellbeing board fit in relation to this causal map? So that's my first line of in inquiry. The second line of inquiry is really about if we've got our emerging strategy, which I've briefly described the what, which are these four quadrants being goals that we've got. There's also something about how we do it, because describing what we're going to do is probably one of the easy parts. How we're going to do it is something that is equally as important. And so we've come up with kind of six ideas about how we might do things. So I'll briefly describe them uh, before finishing on, on a pause point chair. So the first one is around regenerative development. So a, a lot of a lot of uh, the discussion over the past kind of probably five to ten years has been around sustainability or doing no harm or keeping what we've got. Actually, we've probably got to a point now actually we need to do more than that. It's no good just keeping what we have. We need to go beyond that. So actually thinking about how we can regenerate, renew and improve and restore is something that we think is really important to consider in how we do, how we go about what we're going to deliver over the next 10 years. The idea of shared responsibilities, so understanding that what we want to achieve with wellbeing is not down to a single set of organisations. We will all have a shared responsibility in this. So, of course, it will be a collective commitment of agencies, but residents will have their part to play too. Businesses will have their part to play too, and so on. So making sure that we've got that shared responsibilities outlined so people know how they can contribute to achieving uh, those outcomes that we want in the future. Uh, I think we've got an agenda item later, but actually trying to work closer with communities. So we've spoken a bit about our localities approach and how we can get closer to communities, work with communities um, and really take on that kind of asset based community development uh, going forward. Uh, whole system, whole life or whole, whole life, whole system. Um, we've people on this call be very familiar with the kind of considering life stages that kind of starting well, living well and aging well but really trying to take a kind of systematic approach so we understand what's happening, what are some of those relationships that's happening within the system um, and considering that in how we deliver our borough strategy. Nine months, the, uh, the you know, there's been a, a real kind of reliance on uh, intelligence and that's not just statistics and data, that's intelligence that we get on a broad range of things. So uh, that can be from community, community stories, that can be from survey information, that can be from statistics from a hospital. Actually being able to use that intelligence in the round to really drive what we do to help us understand what, what is happening. And as part of that also in terms of understanding what the new technologies, what are the new things that we can do with technology to ensure that our data is, is the best that, that we can make it. And finally, uh, always trying to think about new ways of doing things in the future. So uh, whether that's using different and new frameworks or whether that's really starting to kind of look wider about what's happening across the world and trying to take the best practice, those best things and uh, bringing those to Doncaster. So really trying to be as innovative as we can. So again, the kind of second kind of question is really about if if we've described those six well-being goals and we've just tried to describe how we feel the best way to kind of set about that, um, what things resonate with you? What things kind of make sense? Uh, and what things would you change? So uh, really looking, Chair, for uh, some thoughts on, on, on either of those two kind of pause points. One was around that how the Health and Wellbeing Board can fit in with that map I showed and equally how it then could operate thinking about the, the, the borough strategy. And the second point is around uh, what of the content, uh, so those so those six wellbeing goals make sense. Um, do those, uh, when I describe the how, some of those six things that we described, do they make sense? Do they resonate with what your thinking is as part of your organisations and as a board? So any feedback or any comments would be most welcome as we continue to, to kind of draft this up 
and make changes as we need to. Thank you very much, Chair. Sorry. Uh, Rupert, did you want to respond to that first or not? Uh, I can do, Rachel. I mean, I think it, um, the, the the biggest sort of challenge, I think, for the Health and Wellbeing Board over the last uh, you know two or three years has been um, where do we put our focus? So, as Alan said, yes, you know, there's one option, which is that the Health and Wellbeing Board is interested in everything because everything contributes towards uh, uh, health. But actually, we're only one of a number of partnership groups in Doncaster. And I think it uh, we've certainly talked to this board uh, previously about having some particular areas that we would focus on that aren't um, happening uh, elsewhere in the in the system. And I, and I can see David's put his hand up, but in particular, some of the, the discussions we've had about health care, where the clinical commissioning group and the hospital already have processes to plan, discuss, negotiate that involving the public as part of that. Um, we might not want to duplicate mm -hmm. that. So I think that is the sort of the million dollar question. OK, David. So thanks, Rachel. Alan, um, we had the we were fortunate that Lee Tillman came to our strategy meeting last month, so we had an opportunity to uh, input into it there. So that's the first thing to say, Rachel, is this has been going around individual organisations. Okay. I think um, there's a couple of extra slides added today, though, Alan, and I think what I'd welcome is if we could maybe share them out to the group because they're bits that really I need to have a bit of a longer think about um, that. So it, I suppose it's difficult to come out with an immediate response. I think. Um, you know what's been presented. I, I don't have any major issues with it, but I think the the, the detail behind it. I think we would probably would like to take that back again to our, our organisation, given that we've put some input into it. We've had some feedback from yourself today, and and if, if that's not too much of an ask, because uh, seeing it sort of in your presentation today, I'm not sure I absorbed everything. So the slides would be helpful. Um, you know, and maybe it's a. Uh, I know, I know it's a strange time with the COVID, but it's something we might have spent a little bit more time in our board development session. So I, look, I know that's not easy to do at the moment, but it's, it's probably one for outside of the meeting uh, for, for us to digest, Rupert, I, I would suggest. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd agree, David. Yeah, because there's, there's obviously what's been presented is 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 really good. And it's we I think as a board, I particularly want to make sure that we made the right decisions in terms of how we get involved, but avoid duplication, as Rupert says. Um, and perhaps bring in other partners that perhaps haven't been so involved before, given on what you're given what you've presented. I'm aware that Glyn's got his hand up. So I don't Is it okay to speak? It's OK to speak, Lynn, yeah. yeah. I think from, a, our, from our point of view, uh, the Health and Wellbeing Board is, is there to, to empower communities. So one of the questions I would, when we said about working with communities, <clears throat> one thing always comes to us, what can the council or other than do uh, or stop doing, just get out of the way, so the communities can do it for themselves and about... Mm -hmm investing in the community assets that are already there sometimes the council don't need to be doing everything our partners don't need to be doing everything so it's just investment within the communities that we've got to strengthen the, the communities and also the communities i think the second point is it's about bringing the health and well-being board up to date <clears throat> do they help does the health and well-being board have a twitter account where it put constant messages out after what it's done, telling people what they've done, you said we did. Uh, why, what is, why should people uh, be part of the health and well-being? What is your, so these are the sorts of things that uh, I am asking, and I've just thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, good challenge as always about how we let people know what we're doing. Um, I can't see any other hands up from any other partners. Um, so thinking about next steps then, Rupert and David, I think, as David says, it's perhaps a longer discussion required when possible. Rupert? Yeah, and I think other, um, you know, on the board will also be seeing this in other um, venues. So, you know, thinking about uh, Mel from the police, Dan, 
uh, Dave in particular, you, they'll be seeing this in other sort of um, uh, partnership groups and they'll be thinking through from that sort of partnership group how to uh, to respond. So uh, I think it's useful for us to see where the thinking's uh, got got to. Uh, I think what um, we do need to think through just from a board perspective is where are where would we want to put our focus if you know if we had a a free hand and the chair Rachel yourself you know if you had a sort of free hand in terms of where you wanted to put your energy uh, over the next sort of period where where would that be yeah yeah thank you Rupert I've got Amber then Alan and then James Yes, Chair. Jonathan has put something in the chat about that the slides will be distributed out to uh, board members after the meeting, so we'll get them out. OK, Alan? Yeah, I was just going to say that this is a, a bit of an iterative process and um, you know, I, there are different there are different mechanisms that we're trying to use to enable people to engage with this and shape this, and that's at an in individual, organisational and kind of board level. So um, happy to do less or more more frequent, less frequently as the board need, needs it to be really. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that the board's updated as we go through the process to to kind of ensure that at every level that we can do, people have an opportunity to engage and, and shape it. And um, uh, I'll take direction on, on what, what, what we need more of. So if that's a workshop or, or, or coming back at a different meeting, that's absolutely fine. OK, I've got James and then Lucy. James. Thanks, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, just to, to uh, echo and pick up on Rupert's points is we are you know, an active partner in this and other boards. We're also a commission service on behalf of the council. Uh, and therefore, we, we just, uh, you know, if I speak as a provider, we just need to know where we are going to be commissioned or asked to, it, to tip our efforts in. Uh, we will continue to commit uh, right across this in terms of how we move into recovery in future phases. Um, but I think if the Health and Wellbeing Board has specific focuses and specific priorities they can take them away from the wider governance and, and can lead and drive on those and then as a provider we also understand and, and have a better idea about where the direction where the governance sits as well so I think Rupert make, makes a very good point that this has been shared in a number of different areas but at the end of it there will be some priorities and some focal points and as providers you know it, it, it helps us if we know where the driving um, where the driving board is where the driving partnership is thank you James Lucy yeah, just a request really, Alan. So um, it, obviously, because there's a lot there about working with communities and health and well-being. So um, uh, just a request whether sort of obviously in terms of Voluntary Action Doncaster or the Health and Social Care Forum that I sit on, if we could be involved in this, because I think the, the sector's got quite a lot to contribute to this. Thanks. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, Louise. Yeah, it was just to mention as well that we would have refreshed the health and well-being strategy for 2021. So obviously, that obviously needs to be factored into this as well. Alan and I have had conversations um, about the borough strategy first, but obviously there would normally be a separate health and wellbeing board strategy. So it's just to sort of have that on the radar as well in terms of how it would fit with this. OK, anybody else got any comments? So Rupert, to get back to your question about as the chair, I mean, I think when we had the, um, was it February? It seems a long way away, long, long time ago now when we had the development workshops about where we're going to focus as a board. I think we were all absolutely clear that we didn't want to duplicate, but obviously, and we wanted to have the biggest impact that we could. And I think what we didn't want to be is a group that receives reports um, because other people are already doing the work. It just doesn't make sense. Um, and if my memory serves me right, we very much said that that community aspect was the one that perhaps at that point we wanted to get involved in. Obviously, since then, we've got Voluntary Action Doncaster, so that may have changed. So what I, what I would, I think it's almost that we need that refresh ourselves to think, how do we make sure we have the biggest impact and we avoid duplication? picking up Glyn's point, we know we can clearly say after every meeting, this is what we intended to do and this is what we have done. And more importantly, this is now the impact that we're having in communities. So Alan, just in terms of time scales, sorry if you said it at the beginning and I missed it, when are we expecting that the strategy needs to be completed by? Uh, so we'll, we'll be looking for approvals summer next year. 
so okay uh, so, we've got so, there. so there's there's low there's loads of time which is why this is really kind of emergent thinking but it is something we want to put out for you know this isn't a, a two or three year thing this is something we want to kind of use as a 10 year frame which is why we need to get it right because this this is something that we want to kind of really kind of guide our long-term thinking definitely so rupert in terms of will we have the opportunity to have a a board discussion about this in more detail yes Yes, we definitely will do. I mean, it's, it's interesting when you look at the agenda that we've got uh, uh, today. So uh, the definitely there's things around um, sort of physical activity, the impact of uh, alcohol, and then the role of the sort of third sector in terms of how we might think about sort of commissioning. And there's definitely, I think, a, a, a set of activities around um, sort of broader well-being themes that may not be addressed elsewhere working with the uh, communities and the third sector and also then a sort of link into the sort of inclusion and diversity type approach and those are probably three areas that uh, I, I think we could um, sort of organize around okay yeah so but, but uh, that, that's just an initial thought and uh, I can see David's looking pensive and uh, I think quite rightly everyone needs to sort of take the information think about it go back to the the meeting but if Alan if we want to do a board workshop or another board discussion then um, we'll we'll speak with Rachel and David as sort of chair and vice chair and decide the best way to to do that it's a bit challenging doing some of this on teams where we would usually yeah. do it um in, in sort of different methods, but we will think through how best to, to do this. <coughs> OK, is that OK with you, David, as well, then, that we have that further discussion? And I've got Mel that had a hand up. Yeah, I was just going to ask what the engagement plan is in relation to discussing with the other governance structures, because uh, obviously this crosses across a number of other um, strategies, plans, action plans. I, I could go on. And I'm just wondering what the engagement plan is in relation to uh, the other areas of business, such as the SSDP um, and the subgroups that sit under there that clearly cross over into this strategy. Yep, so uh, really good point. There is a whole heap of partnership meetings and engagements that we're trying to get around to. Um, SSDP is definitely on that list, Mel, um, and it will be uh, we'll be speaking to Rachel about trying to get on that agenda uh, as as with uh, Lucy mentioned earlier about trying to get to some of those other meetings as well. Uh, thank you. I look forward to having the presentation circulated so I can have a, a proper in-depth look of it. Thank you. OK, so I think the action we've agreed is that myself, David and Rupert will discuss next steps with a view to the whole board being involved in in that discussion. Is that OK? I think that's correct. OK, lovely. Thank you ever so much, Alan. Um, I think we've got the actions there. Um, and I, and I, I personally think looking at it, it's, it's really clear to understand <coughs> what we're trying to do. And obviously, again, back, getting back to Glyn's point, if we have to demonstrate the difference we're making, <coughs> excuse me, the language is something that people understand. OK, so we're asked to note that. <coughs> and we will quickly, so I can get a drink of water, move on to the Place Digital Strategy and over to Katie. Thanks, Rachel. I'm just going to share some slides, everybody. I've only um, pulled together a really short presentation to talk over because I think actually um, this update is more likely to prompt a discussion, uh, which I'd be happy to go through. Can everybody see those slides before? Yes. And get going. Right. Fantastic. And then they're big enough for everyone to see. Um, so first of all, I want to just say I don't have all the answers today. Um, the the reason I'm here is I want to reassure everyone that um, digital in, digital inclusion and actually just an inclusive offer is is very high on our priority list. And something as the um, the lead for delivering the place digital strategy that's very important to me is making sure that we have an approach embedded in that delivery. Um, and so I just want to just give you some points today on on what it is that um, 
we're looking at doing in in the immediate next six to 12 months um, and, and and getting any feedback from you as well as to who the right people are to in, involve um, in this approach. I think the thing that I'm hearing already is that you guys have seen that um, you know there's been such a, a speed up of digital transformation in the last uh, eight nine months with with our COVID response. Now, in our place digital strategy, it was developed last year. We have um, one of our our main key strategic areas is access and engagement to our services and how digital technology and services can can help to make it easier for people to get access to information um, and also access into our services. But understanding as we as we put more technology offers in there that we need to make sure how do we make um, make sure that we're not excluding people and that we're not putting more barriers up to our service that this really should just be complementary to what we're doing already. So we had that in our strategy anyway. We knew that we needed to do digital inclusion, but now more than ever we're seeing because of that of that um, speed up in transformation that we need to have a plan and if we don't have that plan then we are going to put um put the more barriers in there and, and more challenges I've, I've just put that quote in the bottom hand corner there because okay, the nhs constitution is saying exactly the same thing we've got a responsibility to make our services accessible um I really do feel that it's wider than digital to make our, our, our services inclusive. Um, and, and for me, when we're asking the questions and we're, and we're embedding this into our, pr our approach, we need to be just thinking about how does digital go hand in hand with that we've got. So I thought it was really important before what Nigel was saying about, you know, the elderly population and telephone calls is that when we're thinking and designing our services, we need to be looking at who our cohorts are and and where we where we choose to use digital um, and if that is appropriate so just this slide here i've just i've just basically broken it into um what our objectives are our immediate um, plans and, and some of the challenges that we face and um, i know joe's already mentioned some as well which i'd like to come to um obviously I've, if anyone wants to put in some any uh, different objectives please let me know at the end of this but i think first and foremost it's that inclusive offer using digital where it makes sense as i've already said and then when we are using digital how do we make sure that um that it is easy to use that it's intuitive that it's accessible that people know how to navigate our various websites that we have and i think that david said earlier this isn't just about um you know Doncaster people who are using our services it's also our staff and our workforce and I've got some really good examples of some of the work we've done with our care homes where you know technology has actually meant that we were able to continue um, services that we, we could have struggled to do with all of the um, the social distancing in place but it's also thrown out some real problems where people who were lacking confidence in using um, you know devices such as iPads or not knowing how to get onto Zoom how do we reach those people? So some of our immediate plans then, in delivering the strategy, we're focusing on our, our priority areas on the place plan. Uh, and what I'm wanting to do as the lead is just trying to make sure that, that every time that we're, we're starting a new programme, we're thinking about how we're incorporating, um, incorporating digital from the very beginning. And what I've found when I get pulled into calls to talk about digital is it could end up being something um, quite specific about how do you add a certain data item to it to a system and what I'm wanting to try and do is get people to think more widely and about you know all of our four strategic areas within our strategy so that we're, we're solving those problems and, and we're making um, access for our staff so wherever they're working they've, they've got access to the systems they need the information they need and also then um, for our patients as well so in when we share the slides on the last page i have just included the section that i've put into our um, assessment that that links to um access and engagement and and what i'm hoping that will do is it will just get people's thinking about things up front because i think we've been um we we tend to sometimes make a lot of assumptions with technology and actually what we need to do is is take a step back and look at so have we got a comms plan set up um do, do we know how people are going to access our services have we even thought about the barriers and i think 
often as much as we think we have, we haven't really um, reached out, you know, to to groups like the PPG or, or via Health Watch, where actually if we have we asked um, where those barriers are and do we know more information? And I think that there's a lot of work to be done um, over the next six months or so to, to really understand who are the most um, digitally excluded in Doncaster and how how do we help them? How do we get them easier access? And in some cases, the answer will not be digital. And 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 I think that's OK. Um, but where we can use digital and we need to use digital, we, that's where we need to be looking at. How do we make sure then that we're helping those people build confidence, build the skills and also have access to kit itself you know some people don't can't afford phones or can't afford um ipads and other devices and so so how can we can we help them with that um we've got some funding in the very last few weeks which is great news to work as part of um a south yorkshire and bassett law ics program which basically is going to support us in doing a lot of that um that that surveying of, of our population and that understanding of, of um, where we've got gaps and, and where we want to target and, and test out um, some of the, the ways to, to improve in inclusion. So I, I've had a first kickoff call and, and there is going to be another call um, in December. And, and what I wanted to say today really is I'm very keen to make sure that we're involving the right stakeholders in this. And I think it's extremely important that it isn't just people, um, you know, that've got digital in the title like I have. It's got to be operational staff people. It's got to be uh, members of our population. So, you know, Glenn, I'd be really pleased if, if maybe I could invite you or someone from the PPG to, to be involved in these discussions, um, because we really need to hear what what are the problems that we're we're trying to solve um, before that we can go ahead and, and actually try and get the solutions. Um, and just one other thing there with the plans is just there are already organizations out there doing amazing things. Um, Rachel, actually, uh, you told me about Knowledge Pool and I've, I've been speaking to Yutunde there um, over the last few weeks. And it's incredible what um, Yutunde and, and, and her uh, fellow volunteers are doing where they've actually they've they've pulled together a, a huge um, basically bible of um of how to to be able to use te um technology and, and all about giving people confidence in skills and it starts with really simple things like how do i use a mouse because i think we we go to things of right let's get people on zoom meetings we need to start before there with some people and you know and, and it's 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 building up confidence and speaking to you Tundi was just so inspirational of what they're doing and it's building and growing in, um, in their offer. And so for me, I want to see, first of all, how can we help them? Can we get them more volunteers? Can we grow, uh, help to grow that organization down? Because also how can we tap into it and, base, and, and refer people who we can see have got challenges in accessing technology or, or see have got um, challenges with skills and, and knowledge pool is just one example. Um, I'm hearing more and more. And one of the things I'm I'm looking forward to in in connecting into this program with them um, with the ICS is that we've got an opportunity to find out about more of these programs that are happening that we can use. You know, let's not reinvent the wheel. If it's something that can help us in Doncaster, let's tap into it. And I'm already hearing about um, organisations that I've not known before. So another one which I've just listed on the the left. Um, corner there um, is befriend and it, it's it's about targeting lonely people and it's a similar thing to um to what Nigel was talking to about before where they um you know they're phoning um individuals up to make sure that, that they have that connection and it's is there a way maybe that we can you know we can start building on those things and, and seeing how we can work with um organizations like befriend to 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 help people who want to use technology because that's another thing there are people who they might not be able to right now but they might want to and if they do can we help them with that um so there's there's some real key things that we're doing there um and obviously if you've got questions about those please do do ask at the end but i think if i can i'd just like to just go over some of the challenges that we've got because this is not typical times and and some of the answers that we might normally go to um would 
we're going to struggle to do at this um, moment in time. Joe mentioned before, and I was really pleased to hear her say about the safe space hubs. And for me, if if I was going to do this, you know, if I was going to look at digital inclusion without um, the COVID um, situation, using local community centres, libraries, you know, that we already have, you know, we're all about the neighbourhood work. And, and Glenn said, you know, let's use those community assets that we've got. We, we would want to, you know, we can put kit in there, we can get people in, you know, social prescribing digital skills, that that would be a great thing to do. So how do we do that now when when we've got um, the situation we have? And, and that's why I just wanted to talk a little bit more about, about the care homes. So in March, we made a decision to, to purchase some iPads to help um, keep, keep continuity of care and support our care home staff. And we distributed those across our older people homes and our LD homes in Doncaster. And we, I was very, very conscious of the fact that what we didn't want to do was just put iPads in homes and they just sit there as, as expensive coasters and, and not be used. And it's how do we make sure that they're already configured and um, it's e they're easy to use and, and what how do we make sure as well that we, we get the training in when we knew we couldn't get into those homes to do that? So we've worked really closely across our different partner organisations and our nursing staff at Ardash have been an absolutely fantastic. We wanted to use relationships that we already have to help build confidence within care homes and um, to be able to use those iPads. And I think that so far it's been successful, but we've we've got to a point where if we want to continue using those iPads even more than we are, and um, we're using them at the moment for things like um, locality MDTs via Teams, which has just been fantastic. Um, they're also being used by homes for, for residents to communicate with family members. Um, and also just things like staff training um, for infection control. So we've got a lot of use out of them, but there's so much more we can do. And there are so many exciting things and being able to share information between care homes and, and our primary care services and, and our other care, health and care settings. Um, but we need to make sure that we're, we're getting those skills sorted and that confidence increased before we try to move on to those next steps. And I think um, just going back to Joe's point about the, the safe space hubs, I think what we need to make is a decision now of actually, in the interest of this, we might need to find a way to actually, we need to do some handholding and we might need to go into some some of the homes to do that. Um, I can't see another way of doing it. You can't virtually skill someone up if they're not confident with, um, you know, virtual um, meetings. So that that's something that, um, we are trying to solve right now. So I think if we if we can figure that out for the care homes, that might help Joe with with what you're doing. Um, and and it's definitely something that I'd, I'd appreciate any um, any feedback on or involvement in. Um, just some more of the other challenges that we've got is is this retrospective work. So I've said about the speed of putting um, some of the you know things like video consultations out there um, across all of our our services really. Um, we've done it and we've actually had some some great feedback, but we haven't done any detailed um, surveying of our population. We, we, we've started some with Healthwatch on our primary care services on, on outpatients for the acute trust, but I do think there's more that we can do and, and we need to understand about making sure that we don't just go for arbitrary numbers like we need, uh, which is sometimes what we're, we're, we're forced into doing from um, from from. The, the government bodies about right we'll have 20 percent um of all consultations will will be video that might not be the right way to do things we just need to make sure that we're offering the appropriate um digital and online services um for our population for the for the, the services that we have and and i've definitely found that by starting to, to do this assessment and work through it with colleagues um who are leading on each priority program that it really does depend on what the service offer is as to how digital can complement and, and can be used. And so it's it's back to that, making sure we're thinking about things from the start of, of how do we want people to communicate with us? How do we want them to access our information? Is technology appropriate? And if it is, how are we going to make that accessible? And so I'll just give you a quick um, brief look here of, like I say, it's going to get shared. These are the questions that I'm asking all of our um, programme leads for the priority programmes on the left hand side there. 
for them to be thinking up front about this um, so that we're really changing the way that we um, we we prioritise in inclusion. I'll stop there because I've said a lot and if I'm imagining there'll be questions for me. Okay, thank you ever so much, Katie. That was uh, really comprehensive and very clear to understand. That is appreciated. So in terms of hands I've seen already, I have got Kath, Phil, Lucy, Glyn, and I've, I'll come to the others. So we'll start with Kath, please. Hi, and um, thanks, Chair. Uh, Katie, that was really interesting and um, I think spot on in terms of your assessment and where you're up to at the moment. Um, I worked um, on a, as a consultant on a project with the Good Things Foundation, which are a national digital charity Brilliant. the other week, or the other year, should I say. And, and that work was all focused about assisted digital support for accessing government services online. Um, so I've got quite a lot of sort of background in terms of working with community centres in providing that assisted digital support for those people that cannot or will not uh, use digital first so happy to um, have conversations with you offline on, 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 just, on that and you. share that. Thanks very much Kath. Uh, Glenn? Uh, can I just say what a fantastic presentation first if that's okay. Uh, Thank two you. parts to me what I want to say. First of all uh, from a personal point of view my, my brother's been in hospital since March and now in a care home I have, I have personality disorder, autism and other me mental health issues. If it wasn't for the fact that I could see my brother through digital, through uh, at the care home in the hospital, I won't be talking today. I won't be talking to, to you today. I would be really mentally ill. So digital is my digital support is one of my passions. I've been mean, spoke to it about to it, to it about uh, Damien Allen on Tuesday night about digital support. It's about reducing isolation and loneliness. And again, a lot of the calls that we get from Safe Space are about isolation and loneliness. I'm asking people to think creatively and out of the box. We've got people who are frequent flyers at hospital, people who turn up blocking the NHS systems. If we invested and paid for a laptop or an iPad, or then give them a year's subscription from uh, internet, maybe it costs £500 a person, I'm not, not sure. It costs five hundred pounds. Do you know what I mean? It, it's about reducing cost all all way around. So I'm asking people to invest in from a council point of view or partner point of view. If you can do videos uh, on and training sessions of how to set Zoom up or WhatsApp up uh, and how to use it, that would be good. Online online training sessions at, at minute. What what the public and staff can access. Would be fantastic if people can learn while they're at home. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Glenn, I need to connect you into your Tundi actually. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cause in terms of those people that haven't got that access, and she can provide that. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, we've now got Phil Holmes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't, I don't want to um, boost Katie's ego even further, but um, yeah, I, I'm glad she mentioned the care home work because the work that Katie's done there has been great. And um, I think the way that she described the objectives as well are really reassuring. So it's, um, you know, in some places you get this whole let's do digital because it's cheaper and all this nonsense about channel shift. And we're just trying to force square pegs into round holes because of some kind of ideology around technology was being great. But um. The way that um, Katie's tried to land it, and, and I think the way that we're all trying to land it, is the ultimate goal is access for local people to the support that they mm. need. Um, and digital is just an enabler. And um, just to take on Glyn's point, um, and just maybe mention, talk about adult social care. Um, I think you're right, Glyn, and I think um, I think sometimes traditionally in adult social care, we don't we don't spend money on enablers um the of the sort you've described and we say no no they can't do that it sounds far too creative and then we, we we channel people into services that are traditional services um whereas actually a, a smaller investment in the sort of support you've described makes a bigger impact on people's well-being 
um, and stops them being either given nothing or channeled into into longer term services that, that it, they could have done without. So I think it's a good challenge and something that we're trying to pick up in adult social care, as I'm sure other organisations are. Thank you, Phil. Um, I've got Lucy. Yeah, thanks ever so much, Katie. Um, in the whole of October, um, we've been doing, um, we've been working with the Catalyst and National Lottery Fund because they had a COVID-19 digital response fund that we were successful in getting. So um, we've been doing interviews with our Creative Directions participants, which is an adult um, mental health um, creative project that we run every week. Um, so there's absolutely masses of learning that's come out of that because it's been quite an intense process. So if you, you're able to give me any uh, email me afterwards, maybe absolutely. we could have a chat Thank about you. that. Because I think this the other thing to th throw in from the interviews that we've done is th the closure of the libraries has been absolutely massive for people. Most people that we've been working with, that has been their link to finding out information, going down the local library, finding things out, and that's gone. Um, yeah. And there is also a fear of everybody moving all their services over to digital and a lot of people are quite reticent about doing it because they say but does that mean I won't get anything face to face anymore um, and so there's absolutely masses of stuff but on a plus point there's lots of our participants who you know April May were saying I won't go near a Zoom music session and we've now got you know 15 20 people at a time accessing music sessions once a week via zoom so it is possible but it's about the motivation and i think motivation is quite a big thing for people but yeah there's there's loads of stuff in there the last question i was going to ask was with the care homes what we're doing is we'll talk about our dance on project later on but the idea is we have you know a whole stash of opportunities for dance workshops that could be beamed into kind of care homes when we aren't able to meet face to face at this point so it's almost a question it's not just about the staff is it it's about the access to technology so that we can actually connect with people as services whether it's a creative workshop or whether it's a well-being session or whatever lucy um mm -hmm. I, let's definitely talk after this um, yeah. because i might have some funding that can help with that and we've been thinking about bigger screens in care homes so that brilliant could, right thank <laughs> I'll you talk to you after. no worries thank you Thanks very much. I've got Jo. Jo, you got your hand up. Yes, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Um, that's the phrase of the year from digital, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just a, a couple of points. I think it's it's interesting. We mustn't forget, as we've talked earlier, that the telephone is is technology is you know it's been around a long time but picking up and speaking to people over the phone is um is a good offer sometimes if that's all is available at the moment uh, and i agree it's about getting the basics right you know we've still got some nursing staff who struggle with turning computers on and so on um and the fun and games i've had with my mum during covid just trying to see more than her forehead on a on a whatsapp video has been tricky so you know getting her to understand how to use zoom would be really challenging um but moving on from that i think it is definitely about choice and diversity of offer so that we've got some people and i wouldn't you know bundle them into any particular age group because I think you know we've got some people in their 80s who are really techy and then we've got some younger people who aren't some people the interaction with services online in in one way or another is their preference um, you know they some prefer um, therapy over video some prefer even just chat you know messenger chat um, and we've in the ICS, we're just putting together proposals to commission an online moderated um, support website. It's a national one. Um, there's a couple that we could use that allows people to go on at any time of the day, interact with peers and with some uh, trained staff and that's moderated at all times in terms of mental health. So for the people that have strong social networks and communities online, that is going to be fantastic. But for people who, like you said, Katie, don't know what um, where their mouse cursor is on the screen, and that's the long way off. Uh, so choice is important. 
which is tricky during COVID, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't plan for it. I think the other thing we still need to be thinking about is efficacy. So from a clinical perspective, I'm talking rather than perhaps some of the, the broader um, offer of different services, but I think we need to be sure that some of the treatments that we offer online uh, do end up having a positive outcome. And that isn't just down to um, what people's preference. The example I gave earlier is sometimes you, you need to be in somebody's home to see if they're neglecting themselves. And it's easy to present something on a, on a camera. Um, and uh, and I think we also, also sort of struggle if that's the only thing on offer. So it's a blend. It's not one size fits all. And it's not every time it has to be that way. You know, I'm sure we feel exhausted by the end of a week when we've had nothing but teams sessions. You know, that social interaction is important. So I'm sorry I've rambled a bit, but I think, it, you know, it's really good for us to bring this together. Uh, digital exclusion is an issue, but only if it's an issue for that person and then they're, they're, they're choosing that they don't want to engage in that way. Uh, but so I think it's really great. Thanks, Katie. Happy to work with you taking stuff forward. Thanks, Joe. And uh, can I just say to that, Joe, as well, um, one of the things that, um, so we'll be working with a um, provider called M Habitat as part of that ICS digital inclusion work. And um, Peter, who we were speaking to, he actually works for Good Things Foundation for four years and, and he, he's great. And one of the points he made is, is just what you've said there about if it's always transactions that might turn people off and it's it's finding a way that we're not just doing it that way and and, and you're absolutely right about choice um but i, I think that transactional part i think that's definitely something that we need to to look at and make sure we get that right so thank you thank you joe uh, vanessa Hi, thank you, Rachel. Yeah, great presentation, um, Katie. Just a couple of things from me. Um, Kath touched on it regarding the Good uh, Foundation. Is um, I'm the chair of the Voluntary Community and Faith Sector Task and Finish Group, um, and there's been lots of discussion around digital inclusion. So it'd be great to involve them because there's a, um, a significant number of partners that could help feed into this. Uh, um, and we, we meet um, every every couple of weeks. It'd be great to get you involved in that. Also, something that um, Glyn brought up is um, around a guide. And we've we've got a gentleman from the Friends of um, Crags in Denebay, Glyn. And he's just um, offered, he's been working with Crisis. And he's offered, uh, with Crisis, he's wrote a guide to how to, um, how to uh, use emails and how to oh. access Zoom. Uh, so it's a, lo a local man from Denneby that's wrote this, working with crisis around people that are excluded and crisis have loved it. And he's come to Well Doncaster and said it'd be something that we could, could we support on. So it'd be great to get Katie involved with that to ensure because um, we're very keen to, to promote that and support that uh, with our with our sector. And then just finally from me, uh, just so that um, I was, it, it is in my presentation, but I'll just comment on it now, is that... Um, so because uh, we were really concerned around financial difficulties during the, the COVID period, we've worked with Citizens Advice Bureau and we've got uh, five community pods um, in the community. PFG um, are hosting one at the moment. Um, and this is a community pod where basically it's, um, if, you're, if you're unable at home to access any of the digital uh, methods if you don't have a phone if you don't have a laptop if you don't have a ipad etc you can go into one of the pods and access um, a, a a laptop and, and com computer etc um, and these are currently hosted in armthorpe carcroft Asken, edlinton and intake they are mobile as well so we can move them around um, and we as a part of the funded assistant advice bureau uh, monday to friday five hours a day so that if they go into the pod and need certain advice um, information they can log on to zoom teams etc and there is an advisor there um, to give them support um, so th those pods are funded till june to get us uh, through the th through the covid period and then those pods will also be available um, in the community It'd be great to get you involved in, in that katie thank you okay thanks vanessa i've got nigel 
Yeah, cheers. Um, that that were really good, Katie. You know, really set out the challenges that we've got, and I do take on board your comment that you know, in, in terms of, you know, we can produce, um, and I'm, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not dismissing them, and I think they're great, but you can produce um, tutorials, um, whether it's a YouTube tutorial or an ad back tutorial, and all these things are produced, but sometimes you have to get hands on. You have to sit yeah. with somebody and actually walk them through that process. And we've been caught on the hop, if you like, with COVID, where this has been concerned. Because obviously with lockdown and restrictions, that's not been possible. So so I think I think the hands-on stuff is great. And I think moving forward, when we do eventually touch wood, get out of lockdown, um, and we get back to some sense of normality, I think the hands-on project is is something that may be so like time expensive but well worth it because you get that that really embedded understanding in terms of what somebody has to do and obviously deal with all the issues in terms of getting online but i also think it's it's around um it's the mediums to some extent and and this goes back to what john was saying that it's a blended approach because it's never going to be a case of one size fits all because you're going to get some people that that, that really don't want to do you know um, online stuff and other people that are quite happy using the phone but again the medium is important so i can say speaking about my community the vast majority of my community use facebook they do not use twitter so so as organizations I think that if they're wanting to get a message across, whether it be the council or, you know, organisations within the, the voluntary community sector, it's about becoming embedded within those community groups that exist within Facebook, for instance. So Befriend are extremely good at this. They get the message out, obviously, you know, through our community groups. But it's also ensuring that there's that secondary link as well. So okay there may be people that are not digitally aware and, and and not online but if befriend or any other organizations put something out through one of our community groups which has got like thousands of people on saying tell your nan yeah tell your gran yeah. tell your granddad make him aware give him a ring tonight what you're doing is is you're making that link digitally but you're also encouraging people to make that contact and pick up that phone and say, hey, up, did you know about this? So so it's about how we use that medium, but it's about what mediums we choose. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nigel. Um, and I've got Nula. I just take my, uh, put my mic off. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Nigel. I mean, I've got, I, I, I worry that we've got loads of community places that belong to the council. I'll give you an example. The Linney Centre has four laptops that are sitting in a cupboard because the Linney Centre is shut. So, you know, they could be utilised somewhere else. But they're there because I used to teach a class there when I first started. I was an IT teacher before I became a councillor. And um, I talked to 19-year-olds and some adults. And it's very, very difficult. And one of the things that the people who came to my class actually wanted, we, they didn't want actually to learn how to use the, um, the laptops. They wanted to learn how to use their phones properly, which is what we've been talking about. Um, people can use their phones for a lot more things than they know. But it is a problem getting out there and, and, and saying to them, you know, how do you use your phone? And I think that to get that message out there, there is help across the borough to actually help people get online with their phones because Twitter and Facebook and you know WhatsApp they're all really good ways of communicating for different people and as you've already said no one learns the same I mean I could teach a class of 30 kids and there'd be four or five different ways and different I uh, won't go into the ethics of it all but how you teach different children so you know it, it's um it's a massive job and I think your presentation was absolutely brilliant that you did at the beginning so um, I, I think getting the computers and the laptops and things out of the centres that we can't open and maybe put them on loan to people and then yeah. have them back at the end of lockdown, if this lockdown lasts any longer. But if our centres aren't going to open, I mean, I think loads of centres have got computers and do run computer classes in one way or another. So. OK. Thanks very much, Nula. Um, everybody's spoken. Do Glyn and Kath, do you want to come back as your hands are still up? Yeah. Yeah, it's just a quick comment, and it's from back of what Lucy was saying, really. 
And I'm just wondering again, a part of the part of the thing that Katie's doing, if we had a digital uh, directory, and what I mean by that, I didn't know about Lucy's meetings. And the most other people's meetings that we have where people can join into. I certainly know that FG have a Zoom meeting every night, uh, where Rupert's been on or herself and you're coming on, is where uh, people can join up, any member of the community, care members, staff, anybody. And since lockdown, we've had 55 people learn Zoom. So if we had a, if we had a, some sort of directory at the minute with all the different meetings that people can access, that's another one away of reducing loneliness and isolation. And the other thing I'd like to mention is uh, if the council or any other organisation or business uh, sector, if they're ever upgrading any computers, that they put them back to community groups to give out to the community uh, to use to reduce loneliness and isolation again. It's just, again, it's not about reinventing the wheel. It's using the stuff that's already there and using it in a different way. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Glenn. I've got David Crichton. So thank you, Rachel. It was just a general, more general point. So um, Kate, Katie's the digital director for Doncaster. She's hosted by the CCG, but she's she's a you know we brought her in to join services and organisations up. And I just wanted to make the point that you know in the place plan, the the three enablers were communications, digital, and workforce. And we we've been successful, and we've got a workforce league coming into place in January as well. And and I think all of us can sign up to and and see the the benefits of having someone like Katie that works across the whole of Doncaster to try and link digital together. It's such an important enabler in in our implementation of the place plan. So it's just to round it up by saying that. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks very much, David. Kath and Nigel, you've still got your hands up. Did you want to come back? Yeah, I wasn't going to, but following on what Glenn said, I just thought I'd <laughs> update um, in terms of just uh, an offer. Um, the director idea is a great one, and we'd be happy to facilitate something uh, with Voluntary Action Doncaster or through Voluntary Action Doncaster. And the other thing to say, um, we just this um, this week, um, well, we will be about to allocate two refurbished computers from charities for or computers for charity. So that's something that we'd definitely be interested in, just sort of recycling and and enabling that that distribution of of, of, of kit to where it could be used best. Okay, thanks, Kath. Uh, Nigel? No. No. Nope. Nope. Sorry, right, it's not coming back in. So thank you ever so much, Katie. I think you've got lots of contacts there. <laughs> I have, thank you. Ideas. We did spend about an hour at the last meeting discussing this, so it's something that's very, really, really uh, important to us all. Um, in terms of next steps, I think it's that you're going to provide another update perhaps in a few months, but I think obviously you've got lots of actions from here um, and, you know, those connections can be made. Um, and I think we're all keen that people have that blended offer. That it's not just a one size fits all because that isn't going to work. Absolutely. Thank you. And thanks, all right, everyone. Then. <laughs> thanks ever so much, Katie. And now we're going to move on to um, Lucy and Dr. Laura Britton, who I hope are going to give us a little dance class, but I fear not, <laughs> um, just to get us moving as we've been sat here for nearly two hours. But feel free if you do want us to get on our feet and you're, you're going to give us an update on you're dance. absolutely on. fine. No, nobody worry about that. Um, I'm going to do... Sorry. Oh, I tell you what, let's take a little stretch first, though. Go on, then. Get your hands in your air. I can't see anyone on video, so I have no idea whether you're doing it or not. And just get your hands down like this. And then you're just going to give your shoulders a roll back. Oh, actually, that feels quite nice. OK, gently move your head to one side and then gently to the other side, to the middle. Take your hand forward. Just pull your head down very gently. Lift it back up. And the best thing that I found for actually easing tension in the back of the neck is imagine that your nose is going around little tennis balls and you go all the way around in the shape of a circle. Just try that now. So tennis ball going round in the shape of a circle. It really eases off the back of your neck. Thank you very much. I wasn't planning that. So there we are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Everybody. You should have that in every meeting. Yeah, okay. we should. And if you feel Definitely. like you want to stretch at any point as well, do get up and stand around. Um, so I'm going to do a brief introduction to Dance On and then I'm going to hand over to our academic partner, Dr. Laura Britton, who's from University of Leeds. Um, 
just for those people, because I know there's quite a few new people to the meeting today. Um, I work for a company called Darts. It's our 30th um, birthday today. Um, well, in fact, this week we're 30 years old and we're a community arts company, basically with well-being at its heart. Um, we work with children and with young people and we use creativity to, to connect people and to try and reduce social isolation. Um, Obviously, a lot of our work has gone online, but we're also doing quite a lot of stuff at the moment in terms of regular telephone calls, packs out in the post to keep people connected. Um, so there's lots of connections with what people have been saying before. Um, today, I'm going to give you a just a short presentation about our Dance On project, which has been running for the last two years. Then I'll hand over to Laura, who may well have some slides to um, present. Just a quick show of hands. Did you manage to watch any of the dance on films that I sent through in the report pack? You could be honest if you have. Can't see anyone. Few nods, few hands. Thank you. Um, we've sent through in the in the agenda pack. There are three short dance on films which pretty much give you the best idea of what a dance on session is like. Um, they're from three different community venues, including our home at the point. And if you want a taste of what Dance On is actually like, I really suggest you watch those. They're only very short, three minutes at a time. So Dance On is a project that we've run in partnership with Yorkshire Dance, Leeds University and One Dance UK. Uh, we originally got funding by Sport England. We received £300,000 um, and that was for work across Leeds, Bradford and Doncaster. And our target population for the dance sessions were people who were over 55 and were classed as inactive. So that's people who aren't getting the recommended uh, weekly 150 minutes phys physical activity. Um, obviously, Laura will go in a bit more detail about the impact that we've had. But the key thing with our dance sessions is they are fun they're accessible, they're within local communities. So our idea is actually to scale up the work so that wherever you are within Doncaster, you're quite close to a dance on session. So they're very community based. Um, and uh, yes, like I said, we've now what the good thing about this and what I'd like the board to um, do is to first to note the presentation that we've done and then actually to see whether you could consider any more practical support for dance on project. And that's not in terms of financial um, commitment because we're very lucky. We've got extended uh, continued funding through Sport England as part of the Get Doncaster Moving um, strategy and work. So really it's about, as you're hearing about the project, how could you advocate for the work? Could you identify any potential links in terms of referrals into the project? Um, and the other thing that we're really keen on is trying to find more COVID secure community venues. Obviously, at the moment, things are tricky. Um, so that's the other thing that I'd need you to sort of be having a think about. So there's time for questions at the end. I'm going to hand over to Laura, um, who's going to talk a little bit more about the impacts of the project. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. If you could just tell me whether you can see that or not. Yes. Excellent. Good start. Uh, yeah, so hello, everyone. Um, as Lucy said, I'm Laura and I'm from the University of Leeds. Um, and I'm very lucky in that I get to research the Dance On Project and visit lots and lots of lovely different communities across Yorkshire. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the aims of the research, the methods that we use, and then the main results that are, that are coming through with our analysis. So I'll start with the aims. So the first thing is that we wanted to see whether the Dance On project could reduce physical inactivity in older people. So as Lucy said, um, people that are inactive are not meeting the daily recommendations. And an inactive person is classed as somebody that doesn't engage in 30 minutes of physical activity per week. And then the second objective was to look at how the Dance On programme improves physical and psychological health. Um, so to do that, uh, we use a number of questionnaires um, and measures. So I'll, I'll just quickly go through the methodology to set some context. So Participants are invited to a dance on taster session in their local community facility. After that taster session, they're also told about the research element of the dance on project. Um, and then once they consent to take part in the research, they um, fill in a number of questionnaires. So first of all, that is the short active life questionnaire, which measures their physical activity levels. 
So to give context, that's how much time they spend walking, cycling and engaging in exercise classes per week. We also then measure their balance and mobility. So that's done through a test called the timed up and go. And basically that's the time it takes them to stand up from a seated position, walk three metres, turn around and walk back. Uh, we also use uh, the falls efficacy scale, which measures their fear of falling whilst completing different activities of daily living. So, for example, that could be washing or dressing. We also look at health states. So that's done um, using a visual analog scale. So on a scale of zero to 100, older adults rate their health state with zero being the worst health state they could possibly be in and 100 being the best. And there's also another um, line of analysis running alongside this project. So we're looking at the cost effectiveness of the Dance On programme via health economics. So to do that, we ask them about their contacts with the NHS, uh, private medical services, different medications that they take, as well as the costs to them as participants. So that could include how much it costs in terms of transport to get to the sessions um, and any equipment or special clothing that they've had to buy in order for them to take part. So after all of those measures are done um, with me, they then attend the Dance On programme. So that's 12 weeks um, initially before the next follow up. Um, so the, the sessions are 60 minutes per week. Um, and as Lucy said, they're led by um, artists from darts across the Doncaster sites and Yorkshire Dance um, for the Leeds and Bradford site. So then we repeat those uh, questionnaires and measures again after three months and then again after six months to see how things are changing. Um, we obviously know that numbers and statistics are great but we also really wanted to get a qualitative aspect in, in terms of the research. So we ask people about their opinions of the Dance On programme and their experiences after three months of taking part as well. So the results, just to give Laura, you... Yes. Laura, just one quick thing. Could you hide your sharing screen thing? Just because yes, it's yes. over. Perfect. I can see all the data now. Thanks. Sorry about that. Thanks for letting me know. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, so starting with the results in terms of recruitment, so we've managed to recruit 114 older adults into the Dance On Research programme. So that's not the programme as a whole, just, just the research element of that. And that was across Leeds, Bradford and Doncaster. The mean age of participants, just to give you an idea of the demographic, uh, was 76 years old and 103 of those were female. Uh, specific to Doncaster, 36 were recruited um, across different sites. So just to give you an idea of locations, that was across Edlington, Barnby Dunn, Carcroft, Walbit, Denaby Main and Bethica. Um, attendance at the sessions has been, has been really good. Um, so on average, over the three month uh, follow up period, participants attended nine out of the 12 sessions offered. And at six months, around 18 of the 24 sessions offered. And this is in line with other research and other community-based um, interventions. In terms of the outcomes, so physical activity increased significantly. So that was by around 77 minutes per week. So we were getting people from those inactive categories um, where they weren't engaged in anything up to 77 minutes per week, which was great to see. And this was maintained at six months as well. There was an improvement in their balance and mobility as measured by the timed up and go. Fear of falling reduced. Um, so that decreased from baseline uh, at the start of the project to three and six months follow up. So people more confident in their abilities to carry out activities without falling over. Subjective well-being also significantly improved. So we measured that in terms of life satisfaction. So they rated out of 10 um, how satisfied they were with their lives nowadays. And that improved and as did happiness. Um, their perceived health state also significantly improved. So people were feeling better about their physical and mental health state after taking part in the Dance On programme. 
And then the health economic study is also showing really positive results. So their analysis um, has shown that the dance on program is cost effective at three and six month follow up i.e. the investment made for the dance on program to run is worth the return in terms of the reduction in the number of NHS contacts, the medications that people um, are needing to take. So further analysis for that aspect um, is still ongoing at the moment. In terms of the qualitative aspect, so we ask participants a range of questions, um, including what they've enjoyed about the dance on sessions. So they say things like it's a get up and go and something for them to look forward to. Uh, one of my favourite quotes that nobody wears a leotard. So everybody feels, you know, comfortable. They can come in whatever they want, obviously, as long as it's safe. But it's not like an 80s aerobic session. Um, the social aspect is really important for the dance on programme. So they get to meet other people. And also the physical and mental aspects of the exercise. So it gets the old body moving and the brain working. We also themed analysis around the health benefits that people have noticed after ta uh, taking part in the sessions. So first of all, the first theme was the mood. So do you notice we never stop laughing um, and your mood, it thingies you up a bit. I think that's a great quote as well. Um, they also talk about their posture and flexibility so I can go a bit further down to touching my toes and I'm not slouching as much. And then that final quote is about the transition from the dance on sessions into daily life. So this participant is talking about the, the gaining confidence that they've had and now they're confident in going over the road to the supermarket. So I think it's good to see that the benefits aren't just within the dance on sessions but it does have a knock-on effect to their to their daily life. In terms of next steps so uh, the main thing for us is obviously publication of this data so we can get um, the word out there about the positive aspects of dance and um, so we're hoping to publish what I've presented today in age and aging um, online dance sessions, so at the moment, Darts and Yorkshire Dance are doing an absolutely fabulous job in continuing to engage older adults in online dance on sessions amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And as part of the next round of funding that we've received from Sport England, from a research perspective, we're looking at the feasibility of those online sessions. So that includes looking at attendance and running focus groups to understand people's experiences of those. And then future research. So there's lots and lots of different directions that this, this dance on programme can go in. And we're happy to align uh, with public health and council areas of interest. So some examples that we've, we've uh, kind of forecast are maybe looking at dementia. So uh, dance on for dementia or more falls prevention and we're also looking at cultural adaptations and um, so looking at what adaptations we need to make for black asian and minority ethnic groups across yorkshire and um, so hopefully i've given a, a good overview of the the impacts of the dance on program i'd like to thank you so much for the opportunity to present and i know that me and lucy are now going to take any questions or points for discussion that anybody wants to raise. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thanks. OK, thank you ever so much for that, Laura and Lucy. And I think that they were probably some of the best quotes I've ever seen in research. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Well, and you plenty more. <laughs> yeah, you can just get the idea that people have really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And the way, and I think it's, we often say at this board that you, you, can't, you can't, you know, you can't silo the effect that a, a, an activity like dance has on just one aspect of the life and the comment there about being able to get to Morrison's and more confident, yeah. it's just absolutely brilliant. Uh, Nigel, I've got your hand up. But I think it may be... Well, not. yeah, I mean, just to say, I mean, the only thing I'm going <clears> to, <throat> sorry, just add to that is, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously it's, it's just been a, a wonderful presentation and so heartwarming. It's, it's if you could bottle that sort of behaviour um, and that sort of response, I mean, you'd, you'd want to sell it, you know what I mean? In, for sort of like clearly hundreds of pounds a bottle. Um, fantastic. And, and, and the work that's obviously come from it has been really, really good as well. And... 
with the increasing level of engagement, it can only go from strength to strength. So, so I'm I'm immensely grateful for it, and thank you very much. Um, thank you. Fantastic yeah. stuff. Thank, thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Anybody else got any questions? I think Lucy did make some asks at the start. Yeah, Can we to repeat those. Please, um, just because it's yeah. a while since I said them. Um, so uh, we're basically what we're looking at doing now is obviously, as Laura's saying, we're doing the um, dance on online sessions. We're also doing dance on socials. So we've done a one one um, next month as well which is about getting people together so it's more of a, a social aspect with dance and music based things so I can send you details of those um, but I'm really looking for um, our next stage is to get back face to face we we actually legally can't do that when we're in tier three so we are continue with the dance on stuff we're also doing stuff like laying down tracks on audio cds and on links so that we can send those out so they've gone out already to all of our participants and we are keeping in touch by telephone there are a lot of people within doncaster that we're working with regularly because that number that was mentioned was only for the research so i'm looking for potential links for referrals either onto online or when we get face to face and our biggest issue, I'll be honest with you, is the COVID secure community venues. So we have the point where one of our venues is. That's fine. We're all ready to go with that when we're allowed to. We're working with Edlington, sorry, Eco at Edlington. But I'm quite interested about where else because we want a proper spread across um, Doncaster. So we have the capacity, we have the workforce skills uh, and experience to do that. But we need people and venues. Thanks, Lucy. You've got the hand up. And then Nula. Thank you. Um, I'd love to do it myself. It sounds fab. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Definitely not being uh, as healthy as I could be at the moment. Um, two, two things really. As in the past, I'm not sure it quite fits your criteria, but we have um, cast have beamed in a, an online um, performance of pantomimes and things for our impatience. Yep. So I don't know if there's something we could explore to offer running some sessions for our um, patients on our mental health ward, a range of wards, so that'd be great. Um, and then perhaps when we do come out and end up in a lower tier than tier three, yeah. we have got um, a community hall on the um, social enterprise site of Tickill Road. Mm -hmm. So it's um, that side of the site, all of the properties are rented out and there's some yoga organizations and so on and some of the community local community in Bowlby come in and friends of um Woodfield Park and so on mm -hmm. I think it's something like 50 pounds to rent it out but you know we can have a put you in touch with Flourish and um mm -hmm. it's a reasonable size we've we've done some other sort of dance classes in there before so that might be an option that's that's really helpful I mean ideally what we're looking at is something that will be around 15 pounds 15 pounds an hour um because what we're looking to do is to make these sustainable so our rates for the dancers are actually a lot lower than we would normally do for our, our programs but the idea yeah. is that we'd be able to get a certain number of people in with good room hire and mm. actually make these ongoing and sustainable so yeah, yeah both of those are brilliant I'll, I'll contact you Joe about email, yeah thank no you will do thank you we've got Nula yeah just to let you know Lucy we've got two venues in Bowlby one's a council venue and the other is um, a private venue yeah. Um, the private venue is £10 an hour, so I think we need to get together and talk about how we can do it. They're yeah. both in the middle of um, old folks' bungalows. Brilliant. So they're quite good. They're good, well positioned as well for this. Yeah. And, and okay. I think I think that's really useful. I think our issue is just making sure because we know a lot of the community spaces, but it's making sure that they are properly COVID secure. They're able to continue to run. Um, so, yeah, that's really helpful. Um, I'll yeah. get in touch with you. Thanks, Nula. Okay, and I can see that Vanessa's offered something as well in the chat. If you can have a look at that, Lucy. Thank you, Tara. Thanks, Vanessa. Okay, so thank you ever so much. I think when we first found out we'd got the money, I can't see any more questions. We first found out we'd got the money for dance, and we were all really excited. And mm -hmm. I think to, to, to hear how it's been evaluated properly, to see the impact, mm -hmm. it's just been really good to hear. Thank um, you. So thank you, Laura and Lucy, for that. No, thanks. Thanks, Laura. Okay. So Andy's quickly taken us on to our next agenda item. Um, just let me check what we had to do with that. It was just for noting that last one. Uh, yeah. And to consider further support, which I think we're all doing by suggesting those venues. So Andy is now going to give us a presentation on, so on item 11. 
impact of parental alcohol misuse on children. Okay. Over to you, Andy. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Can everybody see that? Can everybody see the presentation I've loaded yeah. on? It's not very big, though. It's what? It's what? Sorry. It's not very big, but that just matters my eyesight due to age. That's it's on full for me. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. You carry <laughs> on. Oh, on. Hold on. It's not on slideshow at this end, Andy. Oh, um, no, oh. you've not got it on slideshow for our view. Andy, oh, right. hold on, hold on. Uh, here we go. Yeah. You see that? Thanks, yeah. I'm as blind as about that smashing Andy. Ah, excellent. <laughs> Technology works. So yeah, so thanks for inviting me uh, here today. So I'm going to take you back. Uh, roughly, I'll introduce, introduce myself first. So I'm there on, on the on the screen now. Andy Collins, I'm public health coordinator. Um, here in Doncaster, with I have a particular focus on and responsibility on reducing alcohol harms here in Doncaster. Um, so I want to take you back um, a year. Um, so I completed an alcohol needs assessment, and that was uh, completed in September 2019. Uh, and and what we did, we, we adopted a life course approach. So within the alcohol needs assessment, we started at fetal fetal alcohol syndrome, right the way through to the impact on alcohol in older people. But I wanted to um, to sort of draw your attention to this this today, really. So, um, so here we go. So I'm going to take you even th further back to three years ago when an all party parliamentary group came together to look at this um, uh, um, this topic, and it was called a manifesto for change. And um, our former MP um, was involved in this, and the chair of the all party parliamentary group is uh, Liam Byrne. Uh, uh, an MP. So, so a lot of the data and a lot of the information I'm going to I'm going to provide in this um, um, this presentation is is then adapted to here in Doncaster. But what they say in their in in their manifesto for change was so uh, hard hard drinking parents hurt their children for life compared to other children. Children of alcoholics are poorer physical and psychological health, twice as likely to experience difficulties at school. Three times more likely to consider suicide, which we've already talked about earlier on. Five times more likely to develop eating disorders. And children of alcoholics are also four times more likely to become alcoholics themselves. So pretty, um, you know, th th those um, statements are quite um, hard hitting, really. So I want you to just put up here about definitions of drinking. So um, I'm, I'm sure many of you do know, but um, the so increasing risk is, is classed as over 14 units and up to 50 units. And uh, high risk drinkers, men who drink regularly more than 50 units a week and women more than 35 units, which is 4% of the population. And dependent drinkers are 1% of the England population. So this is a slide from Public Health England from 2016 that shows half a million people are dependent drinkers in, in, uh, in England, but also nearly you know, 2 million are drinking at really high risk levels, which is going to impact on uh, families. So this is this is some facts and figures from the Children's Commission of Silent Voices report from 2012. which is a long time ago. It's eight years ago, so I'm sure they're even worse now. So these are estimates of children living with parental alcohol misuse in the UK who are under 16 years. So as you can read all yourself, 6% live with a dependent drinker. So that's over 700,000 children. 4% live with a problem drinker who has coexisting mental health problems. So that's 500,000 children. 26,000 babies under one in England are living with a parent who will be classified as a dependent drinker. 22% live with a hazardous drinker, that's 2.5 million children. And 20% of adults in England with alcohol dependence have children in the household. And then 7% of young carers are look, who, who are looking after a parent or relative with drug or alcohol use problems. 28% um, of those received an assessment and 40% were missing school or had other indicators of educational difficulties. So again, you know, I, I like my data and I like my facts and figures. So 37% of child deaths and serious injuries through neglect, again, linked to parental drinking. 61% of care applications in England involve misuse of alcohol and or drugs. Half of local authorities, they don't have a strategy to help children, particularly of uh, dependent drinkers. And 175 serious case reviews between in three years found that 47% of cases featured parental substance misuse. One in five children affected by parental alcohol misuse and uh, more than 100 children, including children as young as five, are ringing childline that are worried about their parents drinking or drug use. 
And alcohol plays a part in 25 to 33 percent of known cases of child abuse. So what, what we did was, well, I did. So we looked at those figures and applied them um, to, to um, here in Doncaster. So we know that um, when, when I did this, there was 65,867 children under the age of 18 in Doncaster. So 13,000 children in a household where parent drinks too much, that's based on the all party, all party parliamentary group estimates, figures of one in five. So that's a lot of children. So, and also in 2016-17, 36% of Doncaster new presentations for alcohol treatment stated that they live with children compared to 25% nationally. Um, so you can see, view that as a good thing, it's a protective factor being in alcohol treatment. But again, you know, there is plenty of kids who are, who are actually um, living with a, a dependent person. Public Health in England estimates that we've got 4,313 dependent drinkers in Doncaster. So what they do is um, they give a town and city um, they, they work it out through all their facts and figures, hospital admissions, GP data, lots of other demographic information, and we come up with a figure. It could be higher, it could be lower, but that's the figure that we work on here. So if the national figure of 20% of dependent drinkers in England who live with children is applied, again, coming from a crew, a crude estimate of 862 children live in the household of a dependent adult in Doncaster. Again, could be more, could be less. And what is also interesting there, I get data from um, uh, from John Briggs from from the clinic uh, from the CCG for um, uh, alcohol specific alcohol admissions. So I looked at there was 508 um, alcohol specific diagnosis admissions for females aged 20 to 39 to DRI in the last two years. So I'm guessing you know 20 to 39 are you know women of childbearing age. So. You know, um, an alcohol specific alcohol diagnosis admission takes a number of years to manifest itself, and that's hard drinking over that time. So I also put this slide in because I wanted to relate it to um, the particular, um, you know, the, the the COVID situation that we're in. And this is from Adfam. So Adfam did a report: families in lockdown, the effects of the COVID nineteen lockdown on the family and friends of someone with an alcohol, drugs, or gambling problem. So as you can see there, again, I'm, I'm going to um, you know state a lot of facts and figures. So 80% of respondents said the lockdown is negatively impacting on their family members' alcohol, drug, or gambling problem. Nearly half said that their family members' alcohol or drug um, or gambling has increased during lockdown. Nearly a third said that their loved one has relapsed or their recovery is at risk because of lockdown. And a fifth said their loved one was becoming more physically unwell during lockdown. Nearly a third of respondents said that as a result of their lockdown, they are experiencing more verbal abuse than usual. 4% are experiencing more physical abuse during lockdown from somebody who lives with a, somebody who uh, has an alcohol, drug or gambling problem. And 13% of people feel more concerned than usual for their safety. And that's been reflected by the national and local um, figures of, of people reporting domestic violence. So we are doing something here in Doncaster. So this is um, an Ardash initiative. So this is the families move on together. And that's a partnership between Aspire, who I'm one of the commissioners of, and Project 3, which is the Young People's um, Service. Uh, and it's uh, again, it's, it says there, it's a free program designed to help parents, carers and children talk about own, openly more about their alcohol use. And you can see on the right hand side, I put some um, um, drawings that the children have actually done here. And so on the, on the top one, so this is a child who's, draw, who's, who's drawn this. So evil, there's a bottle of Echo Falls wine, I think it says there, and that's through a broken heart. And then down below, another child did this. So my mum is the one with the gun. The gun is the wine that kill, that, that's killing me. The death is me. So they're really hard hitting things there and, and images. But what I wanted to tell you really here, this, this family moving on together is, is, is in danger of um, not being around anymore because of lack of interest and lack of use of this programme. Um, you don't have to be part of uh, Aspire or Project 3. Um, anybody, you know, who is um, who is in a family who, with alcohol is, a, is, a, is an issue and a factor can access this programme. Uh, if, if people don't refer into it or services don't refer into it, it will be um, stopped, which is a shame. So this year we included alcohol, uh, two questions related to parental alcohol issues into the pupil lifestyle survey results. So as you can see there, you know, there was primary pupils um, uh, figures and also secondary pupils figures. So year four and year six. So year four and year six had nearly 3000 respondents. And I mean, you can read them yourselves, really. But the last one there, 10 percent of pupils stated they got shouted at or told things that upset them with their parents drink or parent carer drinks alcohol. So that's nearly 300 
children of primary school children that that is already impacting on their um you know health and well-being through the parents drinking um so again so what we what are we doing to address parental alcohol issues here in doncaster so where Doncaster Public Health is linked in with Huddersfield University to undertake a piece of work focusing on parental alcohol issues and the impact on children and, and how services respond to that. So it, the, the, the piece of work with Huddersfield University is a facilitated process of critical reflection and in, inquiry into services responses to parental alcohol issues. Just on that, I did, we did some work with um, the Children's Trust. Laura Goff has been a really um, you know, major ally to us at the Children's Trust and she was involved in the, the, um, the, the chapter I did in the needs assessment around um, the impact on children of parental drinking. And when we looked at their figures, 39% of all open cases in the Children's Trust involved alcohol as a factor. So 39% uh, of cases. So just, just going back to this piece of work with Huddersfield, so it'll be conducted largely in three half day online workshops. We did want it to be face to face, but it's looking like face to face isn't gonna happen until the spring. So we really wanna get this um, going and, and off the ground really. And that's really with you know anybody or any service who works with families. So then a final online review workshop will be in May to discuss early indications of the progress, the implementation of any new actions and measures, um, and then obviously troubleshooting in response to the systemic issues and other collective inquiry and changes. So that's a, a, you know, that's a really um, great piece of work that we're looking to do. We've got funding for that. We've got funding from the uh, Police and Crime Commissioner to look at that. Uh, which has obviously been fed up to us through the Safer Stronger Doncaster Partnership and also through the Violence Reduction Group. So th there is a lot of interest in this. So, I mean, th I mean, the main focus for me today is how the Health and Wellbeing Board can help us out with this. So, I mean, public health, I mean, what we can do is we can identify issue issues, we can identify trends, we can look at the data and we look at how we, how we compare with other areas. But ultimately, that's all we've all we can really do. It relies on partnership approach and really, um, you know, you guys and the services that you're involved in to really buy into this piece of work. So, you know, I'd like you to to maybe you know champion this area, uh, this agenda in your areas. You know, we've already talked about the facts and figures about the impact on on, on children of parental alcohol issues, uh, not only the impact now but potentially in the future for their development. Uh, I've mentioned there about where the fundings come from. So although public health is coordinating this work, obviously uh, in partnership with uh, Huddersfield University, but we, you know, we do need you. We need you, the leaders, to drive this agenda forward where you work. And, and also finally there, you know, Doncaster needs to recognise the wider connections and implications of this issue. It's everybody's business. It's not just a public health thing, really. So that's 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 it, really. I'm, I'm just trying to, come, okay. trying to come out of that. Oh, that's it there. I mean, I just, want, I just wanted to show you one... One, one, one other slide, I don't know whether it's still shared, but can everybody see that? Yeah. 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 So basically that's, that shows us how, I mean, this is from uh, the University of Sheffield uh, and public health releases. So every area got these, every every town and no, town and city. Oh, oh, you can't see that? No, all I'm oh. seeing is the last slide. Ah, oh, right, sorry, sorry. Anyway, it, it basically it's, it's telling you that there's there's 3,848 hospital admissions caused by alcohol each year in Doncaster. 17.2 million it costs Doncaster a year for the NHS for alcohol, and 64 adults die every year to just to, due to alcohol consumption. So that's that's it really. That's my. I'm just trying to come out of this. That that was my call to action really. Yeah, yeah. And happy to take really any nice. questions. I've got three, all from children. So I've got Nuala, James and Rihanna. Does anybody want, Rihanna, do you want to start? Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, thank you very much for that presentation, Andy. I think James will, I think James and I will be saying the same thing in terms of presentation of um, children's, um, with children at the front door in terms of pre presenting issues and the majority or a, a big Code as you've identified, nearly 40%, even maybe more, as a identifying factor in terms of alcohol misuse. It highlights to me the link between mental health, domestic abuse, and substance misuse, including uh, predominantly alcohol. And what it also does for me is our thinking that needs to develop around whole family working, where there are parental substance misuse or parental alcohol use and the impact on children, and making sure that we make the links in terms of identifying those families 
and access to services for those families early on. On that, I would really like to invite you to come and present this at our Children's Partnership Oversight meeting, where we can specifically look at how we promote the services that you were talking about, but also make sure that we that we have a um, comprehensive integrated approach across early identification, prevention, right up to where actually people present in the safeguarding arena or in treatment services. So can we please pick that up through that route and I'll make sure that you get invited. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Brianna. Anything else to add, James or Nula? Yeah, um, can I just add something to it? Um, I'm the Young Carers Champion for Doncaster. So I work through the department in the council that um, helps us get out there. And my my role in all this is the voice of the child. And um, we have we have meetings with the child, with the young people that are involved in this because we have a we have a committee that um, speaks every I think it's every two months. And um, some of the things that they say, a lot of it is alcoholism coached with drugs and you know once they get into the spiral it's quite three or four different things and these young people they don't they don't do well in school they they you know they have to get there they get detentions because they're late but it's not their fault um and we did put a system in place for young people so they were carrying a card that would say that if they were late that they were a young carer that they didn't get detention in school some schools went for it others didn't but i think it's important that we we carry on and we actually look for the voice of the child as well because that's important we can sit in meetings as much as we like but if these young people aren't telling us what's really happening out there you know any system we put in place needs the young people's voice in it as well thanks so thanks nula james did you want to add anything Rihanna was right. She covered pretty much all the points I was going to make. So, so thank you. Um, I was just going to make one final uh, question, really, which was um, you were talking about the MOT sessions and that the take up maybe not being as great as you wanted it to be. So, if you if we feel that is an effective delivery mechanism, a referral pathway, what do we know about where referrals are coming from? What can we do as partners to promote that? If there is still some energy and some um, some opportunity to, to to take up, um, you know, make sure that our staff are familiar with it and that they're referring in as well. So, so, so the lady who manages the Project Three service, she regularly goes out and promotes families moving on together. I think there is, there is um, more. She, the more can be done to to promote it, other than just a stand and a stall at an event. You know, I think, I think, you know, um, I mean, I, I will make sure that it's it's widely promoted more than it is. Um, I think there's definitely work to be done, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you're right in highlighting that. I mean, I can, you know, criticise it not being used, but certainly, you know, it, they they do need to promote it more from their end as well. So I'll, I'll make sure that happens. Well, I'm, I'm sure we can help you as well with that. If if if, if we've got the signposts, we can yeah. make sure that the you know people in the assessment teams that might be working with families presenting with these issues are, are are signposted into those services whilst we're working with them as well. It's just getting it's just getting it out to the right people, isn't it? It's yes. just, that you can that you can then um, you know send it out to your team. It's just it's just hitting the right person in the first place. I mean, the outcomes to that families moving on together um, are really good. You know, um, a good, um, good, good. Um, you know, when people do take it up, they do tend to finish it, and the families do get a lot out of it. Okay, thank you, uh, David. Crichton. So, so yes, yeah, so Andy, it's um, it's been a service or been a uh, something of attention that's that's taken a real hit with COVID. And one because obviously people have, have you know that do drink drink in their own houses it's not so visible um obviously the impact on children with not being at school which is why i was such an advocate of children being in the school environment because i think there were lots of issues that we were we weren't visible to um the nhs health checks and even the uh screening health checks when you join a practice that included sort of asking about alcohol intake have had to be put on the back burner unfortunately they've not been deemed to be a, the priority in in the uh, you know the covid response i do hope those things pick up once we get through this wave um but they just a consequence we have to accept at this at this stage I think from my point of view, the takeaway message for me is to uh, just share the message that services are still open. So those people who do come forward, who want to seek, um, you know, some support um, that, that, would, that we share that message out. So that would be the main one today. And, and just look, you know, we will reinstitute those um, screening uh, assessments and, and referring people on once we've got that opportunity to do it. But it, it seems quite, quite challenging at the moment to do that. Yeah. Thanks, David and Andy. There's lots of offers in the chat. If you could take those up. 
um, of yes, people that are offering to up. help. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think Glenn, has Glenn got his hand up there? Is what Glenn's is. got his hand up and I, I'm, I'm just really conscious, Glenn, I want to start in the next minute on the next item so I give them the same chance. So is there some closing comments you want to make, Glenn? No. He's muted, Chair. You're on mute, Glenn, if there's anything you wanted to say. No, perhaps they can't get out of mute. Well, we'll move on. We will have a chance at the end just to see if he's got any further questions. But thanks very much for that, Andy. I think you were really keen to get partners on board. So hopefully that's now going to happen um, and you'll have those opportunities to get um, uh, to get. And obviously, if we've got a service that's working well, we need to make sure people know about it. OK, I'm now going to move us on then. Uh, thank you, Andy, to Vanessa and uh, Kath, which is our last item for today, who are going to talk to us about a number of initiatives um, that are happening in the third sector that we all need to know about. Thank you, Kath and Vanessa. Thank you. So am I sharing? You are? Yes, oh, I can see. Lovely. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, these technical, you think after seven months I'd be used to it by now. <laughs> uh, so, uh, hi everyone. I'm Vanessa Powell Hoyle, I'm Public Health Lead at Well Doncaster, um, as a part of the Well Doncaster programme. And I'm here today to, um, to share information and for support around the uh, community led health and wealth. Uh, program that we've been working on for a, um, a number of years and I did come to the board um, I think it was January of this year around, around some of the work that we've been doing so wanting to share information and just uh, to ensure that uh, all partners are aware of the work and how, we, how it feeds into the work that you're doing yourselves as well so um, um, I will I will start with the presentation if that's okay. So um, as, I've, as, as I've said it's community-led health and wealth um, 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 approach it's around understanding that the voice of the community and taking the strengths of our asset based approach to working with individuals, families and communities is so crucial to achieving our uh, Team Doncaster overall uh, vision. The work that we've been undertaking is, is around supporting and understanding that the community needs to be to own and be a part, of, a direct part and, a, and have a direct improvement around, around supporting the outcomes that affects them, working with them and working with the public surface, uh, services in an agreed way. We've talked a lot about the, using the principles of asset-based community development, the AC, ABCD approach, and this is only the starting point that we've been using within Well Doncaster over the last uh, five years around ensuring that the approach is, is for local challenge and, uh, and opportunities. We maintain a focus on building capacity and releasing uh, grassroots energies and ideas. So what have Well Doncaster been doing over the last five years? Well, we've added to the extensive um, evidence base that investing and supporting working and in empowering our communities to facilitate a healthy community. So some of the things that we've done um, and, and been working with our communities around Well Doncaster is uh, we continue to commit to using a community centred approach. We encourage and facilitate asset based discussions with all of our residents. And we um, encourage communities to be involved in decision making about where they live, work and play. So the community led health and wealth and some of the work that we've we've been supporting um, in, in, the, in the last couple of uh, years, but also in the last couple of months as well, is supporting a range of asset based approaches, gaining in, in, invaluable um, sight, insight into what it's like we're living, working and playing in Doncaster's communities, developing a strong local connection, enabling and recruiting, training and supporting a, 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 a wide range of community explorers, community connectors and community reporters. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But over the last six months, one of the things that we've been doing is we've been uh, creating some population health community profiles for all of our top 20 communities 
and they present. Uh, so we have 10 that's um, live working documents and then we have 10 that are just being finalised. Uh, so for, for the uh, group to be aware, Well Doncaster currently supports uh, the top 10 deprived communities and we are just uh, building and supporting the top 20 deprived communities. So the um, community profiles we are just producing um, are for the next 10 and they will be finalised for partners to um, start to uh, work and support us with uh, by the end of November. And so these profiles um, present population diversity, assets, this covers people, this covers assets as intangible and tangible assets, covering uh, people and place, institutes, uh, stories, local assets, local economy and physical space. Um, we also present the community health within that, so what the kind of understanding of around long term health conditions and the inequalities around health in those communities. We also present and uh, prevention and control around uh, COVID and looking at the areas of, of, of challenge for us at the moment. We also present uh, community information. This is everything around what we know with our partners and our residents of what's uh, strong in that community is in the asset based. Um, and because we are uh, funded, and not, not just because, because obviously, but we are funded by um, Public Health England, sorry, we are funded by uh, Yorkshire Sport, I can't speak today, uh, South um, Sport England, and you I get there. So we're funded by Sport England uh, um, to support physical activity. And so we present the physical activity levels to show how we can have an impact on, on the programme and report back to uh, Sport England. Um, I didn't say at the beginning, just for, uh, for information, the approach is funded by Sport England and also a, a European Social Investment Fund and the Better Care Fund. And we are funded uh, for four years and we are just about to uh, produce for January our uh, four year plan, which we would like partners and um, uh, to come back and, and present that when it, that, that's ready and available. So I did say that we were also funded by the European Social Investment Fund. And so this is around our community wealth builder. This is around um, a community centred approach to our local economy um, development. It aims to uh, redirect the wealth back into local economy by placing control in the hands of local people. The programme supports um, new pre-start existing community based um, enterprise to support their business offers by improving their ability to pr produce products and services to large anchor organisations. We offer bespoke support including one to one arranging of training courses, networking opportunities um, and the chance to engage with some larger organisations offering um, the potential contracts and opportunities to enable local commissioning. And we are currently looking at developing an anchor institution network. Just building on that, uh, we will have live by the 1st of November, 1st of December, we will have an online portal. Uh, this is going to have a, a wealth of resources, but it's also going to have a portal process where large organisations or anchor organisations can put forward any of their um, services that they want to commission and commission in a in a different way and that our local organisations and local social enterprises can upload their information and so hopefully we can create a match to create a better um, local commissioning um, offer. Um, as uh, we've already discussed today in, in uh, some of the conversations, as a part of the work, I support the voluntary community faith sector and uh, the work that we've been doing with, with Kath, and I'm sure Kath can take any questions if, if required, um, is Voluntary Action Doncaster. Uh, we know that a vital part of strong, strengthening our communities is around engaging with the third sector, around ensuring that we've got strategic aspirations for the borough. There are many organisations across Doncaster that provide invaluable support to residents. However, the sector felt that they needed a more central coordinated function, which will enable commissioners to engage with. So uh, Voluntary Action Doncaster is a new charitable incorporated organisation um, and is a part of a cooperative method around fair share um, and it enables to provide an infrastructure support to a point of access for commissioning, uh, partners uh, to work with diverse groups around voluntary community and faith sector operating in Doncaster um, and 
to serve the needs of the of the residents. So in Octo October of this year, all of the seven trustees were recruited from um, a wide range of of third sector organisations, and they were done. They were recruited by a um, a voting system to ensure um, equity. Equability, I can't speak. Um, and uh, also, additionally, there's a chair and a, a trust um, and, a, and a treasurer. The trustees will represent the third sector at strategic partnerships in line with the Team Doncaster um, outcomes. So, to date, we've already been working with Voluntary Action Doncaster and the third sector on a number of pieces of work. This has involved a, a volunteering hub, um, a funding bid, so already pulling together a collaborative funding bid. Um, uh, CAS um, recruited a, an apprentice to support the work. We're also looking at the sector directory. So what was your life Doncaster and transitioning that over to the, uh, the third sector to manage and support. And also um, we're looking at, at, at supporting, continuing the newsletter that Katie uh, may have presented earlier and Voluntary Action Doncaster have taken that, that um, over now. And um, they have over 2000 uh, people um, accessing that, um, so that's great news. So all of the work that we've been doing with supporting the Social Isolation Alliance. So this is going to be a governing body for, in place for three years with the work that Rachel um, initiated. And Rachel and I, it seems a long time ago, we were in a civic office trying to uh, support this. So it's great that this is this is moving forward with a primary focus on working together to support the effectiveness around uh, social isolation and loneliness. The board uh, will adapt a strategic approach to support in the delivery of the Alliance through COVID-19 support uh, through the, com um, the community hub. They've done some great work. Um, basically, they were there straight away supporting um, the community humanitarian support um, and supporting a, um, a work around ensuring that they, um, they, uh, the groups that offer um, social isolation and loneliness support um, were supported and, and helped through the, um, the pandemic. Also is a forum for discussion to create key priorities and I'm working with the, the, sect, uh, the uh, Alliance on how we can move this forward and encouraging strengthening links between services and the people and agencies. A number of things that we've been working on is sector's voice and how we can facilitate that. Uh, the uh, support in the voluntary action Doncaster on the community directory and also leading on the community faith sector fun funding panel that will be around enabling um, joint bids. Um, so just to just to give a little bit of an overview on that is that we're looking at supporting a humanitarian fund uh, with the uh, some some money from um, the uh, the tier three fund around um, supporting the third sector mm -hmm. and the, the third sector have come together and recommended that there are three funding uh, processes that will be a light touch which will be up to 750 pound for very very small organizations to apply for in a very very um, natural and non-challenging way around just being able to maybe send a video or a telephone conversation to the panel so that uh, they can um, they can access the fund and then a fund of up to five five thousand pound this will be more of a um uh, an application uh, to the panel um for funding and then also a collaborative fund and this will be for up to twenty thousand pound for up to four organisations with the same vision to come together to have a collaborative bid that can help us potentially move move forward with some strategic commissioning. And then just finally, um, just uh, some of the work around strategic commissioning. So the development of commissioning um, is is vital that we we support it around the localities model and Well Doncaster have been have been supporting this. The changes in commissioning and the decisions need to be more around supporting and, in, and providing information and gathering information from the third sector to ensure that we have the right, right opportunities for our residents. We we'll want to also ensure that the public services are planned and delivered based on the local strengths and needs in a whole system approach. So just a little bit about Well Doncaster Community Commissioning, uh, some of the work that we've been doing in the in the in the last uh, couple of years and the last six months regarding COVID. 
So um, the debt management support that we talked about um, earlier that I just discussed at Kate's pre presentation is working with Citizens Advice Bureau in those community pods and ensuring that uh, our residents have access to digital around their financial challenges. And we're looking at how we can continue with that. Uh, we've been working with Aspiring 2 for a number of years now, and this actually en enabled us to access the European Social Investment Fund because we've been doing some pump priming around uh, business startup and self-employment. And it's the inspiring work that's actually helped us to, to access that 800,000 from the uh, uh, European Social Inve Investment Fund. Uh, wellbeing support as well is so during the COVID, Rupert was very, very conscious of the, the challenges of wellbeing of our residents uh, around the, 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 sorry, around the floods. And so we've been working with Woodland Speaks around um, this is a, it was, it is face to face and online, but this is a wellbeing support in a coaching mechanism offering um, uh, basically uh, different forms of um, counselling to support residents and uh, currently we are still managing to be face to face for 80% of, of that work. Shared lean, learning, this is a shared reading, sorry, this is a, a programme that we've been supporting around encouraging our residents to have peer to peer reading and we've been doing uh, a piece of work around sh the shared learning and sh shared reading opportunities and we're just evaluating that at the moment. And then community connectors. So I did uh, say at the beginning of my presentation. So what is community connectors? We we, we recognise that our communities um, um, have got so much val value in actually working on a peer peer to peer work. So we've been working with five host organisations um, to recruit community connectors. So we fund them for ten hours a week. Um, as a pilot, it's for one year, it's funded by um, Sport England and it's for those people that maybe want to think about uh, gaining into employment, have a real good strong connection in their community and so they will work with the uh, residents around engaging people to get out and about, get more physically active and encouraging them, encouraging them to be able to, um, to be a part of the community and start to actually, um, in, the community connectors will, will be part of, of understanding and gaining insight into what our community residents are, are wanting um, to undertake and and get get help us get out of, of of covid by understanding and gaining some great insight so thank you um if there's any questions just asking the um the board to um to uh, take the uh, presentation as information, but also for partners to to um, put forward any recommendations or any work that uh, they feel that we would be able to do in, in partnership. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vanessa. That was uh, comprehensive, and there's an all, there's so much going on that I think we probably didn't all know about all every every bits of it. So that's really good. Um, just looking at questions, I've got Rupert. Yeah, it's not really a question. I think it's a comment really building on what you've just said, uh, Chair. It is clear that there is an awful lot going on. Uh, and that definitely there is some work that Vanessa, the team and Kath are doing to understand more and more what's uh, going on uh, out in our communities. And I think they're trying to tread a sort of thin line between uh, support and knowing what's going on, but not uh, taking over so where things are already going on the last thing that most groups need is the council or any other statutory organization um and um, sort of you know sort of taking over but where there are opportunities to bring additional resources into Doncaster to support groups with funding people do need to be able to to do that and i think you know, it, hopefully what you've got this morning is a, just a sense of the breadth and the amount of things that are going on. What we what I'll be asking Vanessa to do uh, with the team is to start sort of trying sort of codifying some of that 
and we may want to come back with something more formal to you in terms of our, either a sort of strategy or action plan. Uh, but it, we thought it would be a good opportunity to just make you aware of what's going on. And I know Kath probably wants to add from her perspective in terms of what she's seeing, because remember, Voluntary Action Doncaster is a very new organisation and is going to be very different to any of the third sector support organisations we've seen previously. Yeah, Kath, you've got your hand up. Yeah, and it was exactly that, Rupert. I was just uh, wanting to say that you know the way in which Voluntary Action Doncaster um, has been set up is very much um, on a cooperative and fair shares model. Um, so um, we'll be asking our trustees to play their part in proactively representing the sector as well as, as best they can, um, and, with, and and be that broker for two-way conversations. Very much fostering partnership and looking at how we can share. Um, resources to build capacity and capability um, as a network and various networks of networks within the, the the third sector within Doncaster. So I think it's going to be really exciting um, as well as challenging to um, draw all the, 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 the lines between all the dots of the various different disparate pieces of work and 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 the assets and then it's not just money it's it's knowledge skills time all those kinds of variables that we just want to harness as best we can um so information sharing um upwards but also gathering that insight from 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 organizations and the reality of of, of that voice from from residents that are, are, are using those community resources on a daily basis. So as we grow and develop, um, that's certainly where we think we'll be able to add value. Good. Uh, thanks very much, Kath. I've got David Crichton. So just just to put to Vanessa and Kath, I'm conscious that on the co on the call today, we haven't got Laura Sherburn, who's the chief executive of the Federation for GPs. But I'm hoping you're both linked in with her because I know she set up a number of meetings um, approximately 12 months ago, including primary care and the medical resources. So that you were talking about making connections. So uh, that's definitely an individual you're nodding. Your, I hope you're nodding your head because not just you see it as important, but you've actually got that link in with Laura. Because yes, I think that's. So um, I don't know if you know, David, but in 2015, Laura was one of our community explorers. For, um, okay. Laura and I work very closely together. We're just about to recruit uh, um, five Be Well officers into funded by primary care. Um, so, yeah, um, but yeah, we are very, very connected. Thank you. Thanks, David. I've got Glenn. May I just a comment to uh, Vanessa and to the team? Uh, I, I joined as a community connector and I did a lot of work in Denby with Vanessa. I, and I just want to say thank you for all the hard work and commitment that you've shown to communities and to people like yourself. Uh, and the, the skills that we've learned from joining the different uh, uh, training sessions and the stuff we've done with you also it impacts on our daily lives, which has made me a lot healthier, made me a lot resilient, made me a lot, a lot mentally well. So I just, it's just a personal thank you for me. I know uh, people focused up PFG values it very highly. And it, again, it's just absolutely amazing work. Thank you. Thanks very much, Glenn. I can't see any more questions or comments. So that brings us to the end of the meeting. Um, I think that today for me, the meeting has demonstrated the breadth and depth of what we're doing in Doncaster in terms of health and well-being. So I'd like to thank all the presenters. Uh, thank you for your excellent presentations, being absolutely clear about what you want us to do as a board. And I really would encourage all partners um, to, to carry on those conversations that we've started uh, through the chat function. Um, and please, if you haven't, you know said anything up to now in terms of how you want to get involved please you, you follow up on those uh, conversations afterwards i think perhaps what would be useful amber is if we could send um a list of the presenters and their contact details so if people do want to have that ongoing conversation that would be there if that's okay no problem uh, chair can do that lovely uh, thank you ever so much everybody um we're next meeting again in january 
Um, 2020 will, has been a year like no other, and hopefully one we don't see again. Um, but I think what it has done is is demonstrate how far we are in terms how far we are on in Doncaster in terms of partnership working, particularly around health and well-being. Um, so thank you all again for everything you do. Thank you to the t your teams for the brilliant work you do. And please all look after yourselves. And it might be a little bit early, but I won't see some of you before this. So do have a lovely Christmas and New Year. And let's hope that 2021 is is better than 2020. And we've now got from Nigel a Merry Christmas gift, I think, in the <laughs> chat for us all to see. Thanks. Okay. Thank you ever so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Oh, Thank take you. care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.